Planning Board is now in session on Thursday, October the 8th, 2020, um, for its uh, Planning Board's 23rd virtual meeting since March. So during these continued challenging times, we remain committed to promoting a safe and healthy environment for our public, our applicants, our stakeholders, and staff, while continuing the business operations to propel Prince George's County forward. I'd like to take a moment to remind everyone in our viewing and listening audience of, of the participation guidelines for our hearings. So speaker pre-registration and pre-submission of comments and exhibits is required. So if you look at the screen, you can see how to become a person of record and to, to participate, all participants must pre-register and all materials or exhibits must be submitted by 12 noon on the Tuesday before the Planning Board meeting as depicted on the screen, as announced in our weekly meetings, and as posted on our website. Registered speakers and presenters connecting through a computer, tablet, or smartphone can join the meeting with the link provided via the email from the Planning Board office. Online registered participants may be prompted to install GoToMeeting software in order to participate in the process. Registered speakers may also listen or participate in the meeting using a phone line, the call-in number provided via the email, um, uh, yes, and we ask that all participants mute your phones when not speaking, but do not put your phone on hold. To eliminate audio feedback, only one connected device with sound should be in the room at the same time. Of course, as depicted on the screen again, the public may continue to watch planning board meetings streamed live, or if you wish to become a person of record, you can sign up on our online web form. Please see the screen again for instructions. So as always, we commence our meetings with a moment of silence for those who have passed on in the intervening week since our last planning board hearing. So we want to remember the ever growing number of victims of the widespread coronavirus. We have more than 7.5 million cases and more than 1 million cases worldwide and over 200, about 211,000 deaths in the United States. We want to remember that these are all human beings and we want to remember those who have passed on and hold their families in our hearts and prayers. Throughout the nation and our world, we want to remember Bob Gibson, who was the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame pitcher who played 17 seasons as the starting pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals and also played briefly for the Harlem Globetrotters. Rudolph Val Archer, age 91, one of the last remaining renowned Tuskegee Airmen who served in World War II. He served in three war wars, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Eddie Van Halen, tender age of 65, Hall of Fame guitarist. He led his band, Van Halen, for four decades, and he was among the top 10 guitarists of all time, according to Rolling Stone magazine. Tidbit, he was also known for his iconic guitar solo in Michael Jackson's Beat It. Johnny Nash, singer, songwriter, actor, producer, known for his chart topper, topper I can see clearly now. Many of you will remember that song. He also helped launch the career of his very close friend, Bob Marley. Thomas Jefferson Bird. He was known for his roles in Spike Lee films, Clockers and Get on the Bus. James John Snowden Jr., age 78, former offensive tackle for the Washington football team. There are many others. So we want to remember everyone who passed during this intervening week. And of course, we extend our deepest sympathy to any of you who may have suffered the loss of a loved one too. Our hearts go out to you. May we have that moment of silence, please. Thank you. So again, this is our second planning board meeting in the month of October. It is the last week of Hispanic Heritage Month, where we celebrate the amazing culture of the Hispanic Latinx community. We've had many, many uh, celebrations throughout the commission, um, Prince George's and Montgomery Sot County, but both, all of them have been virtual, but they have been amazing. It is also Italian American Heritage Month and Polish American Heritage Month. And 
the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, and in Prince George's County, we celebrate and embrace diversity. Um, it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Please get checked, have your mammograms, women. Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We must stamp out and eradicate domestic violence. We're doing a good job in um, progressing, at least here in Prince George's County. However, this, this um, quarantine environment has really escalated domestic violence where people are clustered together. So we, if you see something, say something and, and ask people to seek help. It is Bullying Prevention Month. No matter who's doing the bullying, we will not tolerate bullying. And many, many young um, teens are subjected to bullying um, and parents may not be aware of this. So make sure we talk to our kids. It is Down Syndrome Awareness Month as well. It is AIDS Awareness Month. It is National Crime Prevention Month. And to top it all off, it is Emotional Wellness Month. Let's all work on that one. Uh, in the food department, it's National Seafood Month, Chili Month, Pizza Month, Sausage and American Cheese Month, and National Popcorn Poppin' Month. Um, October 8th, on this day in 1871, it was day one of the three-day Great Chicago Fire, which killed approximately 300 people. 1934, Bruno, Bruno Hauptmann was indicted for the heinous murder of Charles, Lim the, Charles Lindbergh's baby. Um, it was awful. 1945, 1945, the microwave oven was patented. Now, I'm not sure what took so long after that. 1971, former Beatle John Lennon released Imagine. I keep thinking of that song because I'm imagining a number of wonderful things this coming month. 1957, Jerry Lee Lewis recorded his biggest hit of all time, Great Balls of Fire. Um, and then 1977, Billy Joel's uh, breakthrough album, The Stranger, um, was released on the Billboard chart, charts with um, top 10 hits, Just the Way You Are and Only the Good Die Young. Um, with that, I'm going to turn to some other announcements. We have a, our 2020 budget forums. We already had one in September. Um, they're being held virtually this fall, and the public is invited to provide comments on the budget um, for, park and plan for, for planning for parks and rec in Prince George's County. The second and next virtual forum will be held on um, October 13th at 7 p.m. So you can sign up to speak by Monday, October the 12th at noon, and you can visit, here, everything is depicted on the screen, you can visit pgplanningboard.org and click on testify at a hearing. If you do not wish to participate that way or you cannot confine your comments to three minutes, you may submit written comments until the close of business on October 27th by email, fax, or mail. The planning department. Um, the West Hyattsville Queens Chapel Sector Plan virtual community kickoff meeting will take place Saturday, um, October 17th at 10.30 a.m. Residents, property owners, and stakeholders will learn about the upcoming sector plan for the areas around surrounding West Hyattsville, including portions of Hyattsville, Mount Rainier, and Brentwood, and your opportunities to participate in the planning process. So see the slide for details. Next. Join the planning department, the Department of Parks and Recreation, and the Prince George's Arts and Humanities Council for a virtual community meeting on the cultural arts study on Saturday, October 24th at 10 a.m. You can learn about the first comprehensive inventory and assessment of the county's diverse and culture ecology and ways to participate in the planning process. We have an abundance of um, artistic, we have t uh, artists, um, talent, we have venues. We have so much to offer in Prince George's County, but it's not been compiled for everyone to see. So this is a wonderful opportunity, and you can participate on Saturday, October the 24th at 10 a.m. Next, um, slide four, we have the Departments of Parks and Recreation, your guide. Now, typically this is mailed out to people. It's a very huge um, guide, um, but this time it's all virtual, and it's available online. Um, you can browse through the publication for outdoor, virtual, and limited, very limited in-person activities. You can visit pgparks.com to, um, to link to the e-publication and register for any classes that you might want to take. Um, 
senses. So there's been much confusion about the census. Um, due to the COVID um, pandemic, the census um, was extended to October the 31st. Then it the federal government moved the deadline up to September 30th. Then the Census Bureau said the deadline was October the 5th. And now a federal court said, no, 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 it has to go back to October 31st. And so now the Census Bureau, the federal court, we all know that the new deadline is October the 31st. So it is imperative that we keep the momentum going. Um, the, our response rate, our self-response rate in Prince George's County at this time is 69.6%. That's better than we did in 2010, and is a source of um, it should um, congratulations because um, in this COVID environment where we had to stop our in person or a lot of our in person events, uh, it's amazing that we we are a little bit ahead ahead of what we did in 2010. However, not good enough. So at 69.6, we only have 0.4 percent to go to get to 70 percent. At a minimum, we have to get to 70 percent hopefully beyond. So we have until October 31st to do that. Encourage your friends, your neighbors to complete those forms online or by phone. The numbers are on the screen, my2020census.gov or the number as listed on the screen. We also want to take a moment to say happy birthday to our own Lori Smothers in the office of the general counsel. Yes, she is being embarrassed today, uh, much to her chagrin, I know. But happy birthday, Lori. And then finally, um, some of us will remember, some of us of a certain age remember Mark Spitz of California um, and then Hawaii. He was the, is the powerful competitive swimmer, nine-time Olympic champion, seven gold medals in the 72 Olympics, the record that he held for 36 years. Until another competitive swimmer, this time a little closer to home, came along. That person is Michael Phelps, the competitive swimmer from Baltimore, Maryland, who broke Spitz's 36-year record in the 2000 um, Olympic Games by winning eight gold medals, topping Spitz's seven gold medals. And he has 28 Olympic medals altogether, 23 of which are gold. Phelps is the most successful and most decorated Olympian of all time. But wait, even closer to home, I mean, we're talking Mitchellville, right here in Prince George's County. We're talking, now, the Sailfish Ship. That's right. We're talking Attorney Bill Ship, who is our, in our land use community, a great attorney, a great human being, um, who swam his way through law school following some serious health challenges in, in the past decade. Um, he can tell you more about, you can find out more about his health cha challenges if you watch this video. Um, but he swam, he challenged himself and began swimming the 10 mile, um, a 10 mile swim in Vermont. He challenged himself to increase his distance incrementally. He swam across the Catalina Channel, the Chesapeake Bay, G Gibraltar, the island of, Man around the island of Manhattan, and even the English Channel. He is a marathon swimmer. He's com uh, completed all those open water swims and then some. And he's now featured in the YouTube clip depicted on the screen, Marathon Swim Stories. So we want to take a moment to congratulate our own Prince George's County's um, marathon swimmer, Bill Ship. So congratulations, Bill. And you've done a marvelous job and we're glad that your health has uh, improved dramatically. So with that, we're going to turn around and start our, um, oh, and the other thing we're going to say is, um, you know, Monday, many of us are off, not everybody, but um, so we, in 1492, we were told that um, um, America was discovered, Christopher Columbus discovered America. America was indeed occupied with real, live human beings. So I wish everyone a happy Indigenous People Day. Thank you. Okay. So we are here getting ready to start our development review items. We have our commissioners on, on the line. I'm going to start with Vice Chair Bailey. Present. Um, Commissioner Dorner. 
I he may be muted, but we can see him. Okay, we're not hearing you, Commissioner Dorner. We're gonna come back and while we figure that out. But I'm gonna Commissioner Geraldo. I'm here and I'm looking at Commissioner Dorner. He's here. Yeah. He's gonna wave his hand. Yeah, we all looking at him as what I mentioned, yeah, but he's we've gotta get him get his sound up. Um, we are also here, we have our um, planning director here, Ms. Ms. Um, Sheckley. We have our um, technical hearing writer, Ms. Kratka. We also have our um, uh, associate general counsel, um, or, and our lead counsel for today, I'm sorry, we ha um, with us today, Peter Goldsmith, and let's see who else do we have. We have um, Kenny Flanagan, who is our senior planning technician, who is working the PowerPoints today. And we have Ryan Cron, who is our visual media specialist, who's um, keeping everybody uh, uh, working today. And I met, and Peter Goldsmith is not associate general counsel. He is senior counsel. Thank you. Senior. Senior, yes. And we also have James Hunt, who is the chief of development review, who is keeping everything moving along during this pandemic. So, um, how are we doing? Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so we're going to pause for a moment and we're going to um, await um, Commissioner Dorner's return. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So I'm going to get started with just the preliminary things, starting with the draft minutes of the planning board meeting of um, September the 17th and the 24th and October the 1st, 2020. Is there a motion? Approval, Madam Chair. Is Second. Okay. okay. I have a motion by um, Commissioner Geraldo, seconded by Commissioner Dorner. Um, um, Commissioner Dorner? Vote aye. Commissioner Geraldo? I vote aye, Madam Chair. Okay. The ayes have it 3 0. Um, we also have the consent agenda. Um, we have draft rev no, no, resolution PGCPB number 2020 137. Is there a motion? And that's Potomac Energy Holdings LLC. Details move side plan. Madam, Madam Chair, I move to Dorner a second. Okay. Um, motion by Commissioner Geraldo, seconded by Commissioner Dorner. Um, uh, Commissioner Geraldo? Aye. Commissioner Dorner? Good aye. Okay, the ayes have it 3 0. Okay. Um, the next item is, is item 10, which is Dobson Ridge. It's preliminary plan 4 2002. I'm going to check. Um, Mr. Heath? Present. Mr. Tedesco? Good morning, Madam Chair. I'm present. Wonderful. Uh, Ms. Riser, I saw her cup shine on. Yeah. Okay. Um, I saw her sign on. Okay. Um, Mr. Burton? I'm present, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Ryan? Present. Ms. Thompson? Present, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sun. Present. Um, Lance, Lance, um, El Lunk, Lunk. I know you, um, Mr. Lunk signed up to speak. I don't see his name there. I'll come back to Mr. Lunk. Um, um, Dion James Zanfordino. Dion James Zanfordino. Okay, Anthony James and Zan Zan Zanfordino. Okay, well, this is going to be a, a motion for a continuance, a request for a continuance. So maybe those folks aren't on because because of the continuance. So let's go to Mr. Heath. 
Yes. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Good morning. For the record, Antoine Heath with the senior planner with the subdivision and zoning section. Uh, this is a preliminary plan for 4 2002 Dobson Ridge, consisting of 196 lots and 16 parcels for single family attached dwelling. By letter dated October 2nd, 2020, the applicant's representative, Matt Desco, granted a waiver of the 70 day review period and requested a continuance to the planning, the planning board hearing date of December 3rd, 2020. If the application is continued to December 3rd, 2020, no additional posting will be required. Staff recommends approval of the continuance. Um, thank you, Mr. Heath. I'm just going to turn to, and I thank you for mentioning the. Um, the request for the written request for a continuance and the 70 day waiver and that is included as applicants exhibit number one mr tedesco good morning madam chair members of the commission um planning good board uh, for the record matthew tedesco the law firm back me here on behalf of the applicant dr horton um we'll submit on the record i want to thank mr heath and miss connor for their uh, support of the continuance to december 3rd as well as staff's uh, acquiescence to that new date uh, to give us just a little bit more time to, to work out some of the um, items in the Senate report. With that, we'll submit and respectfully request that this be continued to December 3rd. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn, so let me call those speakers again. Just um, Mr. Lonk. I don't know who the caller is. Um, Dion James Zanfordino. Anthony Zanfordino. Um, is there a motion to continue to December the 3rd? Madam Chair, uh, this is Commissioner Geraldo. I move that we continue case number 4-20002, uh, given, uh, given the applicant's waiver, to December 3rd, 2020. Thank you. Second, uh, Bailey. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Geraldo, second from Vice Chair Bailey. Um, I'm going to call the roll, call for the vote. Um, Madam Vice Chair? Vote aye. Commissioner Geraldo? I vote aye, Madam Chair. Commissioner Dorner? Vote aye. Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have item 5, which will be followed by item 7. Item 5 is the 2018 Water and Sewer Service Area Changes, the June 2020 Cycle of Amendments for CR 87 2020. Ms. Thompson, are you on? I'm sorry. Good morning, Madam Chair mm -hmm. and members of the Planning Board. For the record, I'm Ivy Thompson with the Countywide Planning Division. This is a review of the requested amendments to the 2018 Water Sewer Plan for June 2020. Staff is seeking permission to transmit comments to the Prince George's County Council. Next slide, please. The Prince George's County Council introduced Council Resolution CR 87 2020 for the June 2020 cycle of amendments at their July 7th, 2020 County Council meeting. Per the environmental article of the annotated code of Maryland and the adopted 2018 water and sewer plan, the planning board is required to provide comments to the county council on council resolution CR 87 2020 and contained within this resolution is one application for the June 20 cycle of amendments to the 2018 approved water and sewer plan. The public hearing for the June 2020 cycle of amendments will be held on October 13th, and the Prince George's County Council Committee as a whole will discuss the county executive recommendations during the following meeting. Next slide, please. The Planning Department staff reviewed two projects. However, the Victoria Falls request was withdrawn. Next slide, please. The Signature Club, addressed as 341 East Manning Road in Akakeek, Maryland, is located at the northwest quadrant of East Manning Road and Berry, and Berry Roads. The proposal is for the development of 80 single-family attached dwellings 
and the planning department and the county executive's recommendation is to advance this application to water and sewer category four community systems for adequate community system adequate for development planning. I apologize for the background noise. Next slide, please. Staff requests planning board approval to transmit the June 2020 cycle amendment comments to the Prince George's County Council. And that concludes staff presentation. Thank you. Um, let's see if there's any questions. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. No questions, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Dorner. No questions, thank you. Um, Commissioner Geraldo. Commissioner Geraldo. You're muted. Commissioner Geraldo. Hi, how no, are you? No, we're good. Any questions? No, I have no questions. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move approval. Okay. We we have a motion from Commissioner Geraldo. To accept that. Second. Second. Okay. Um, as elaborated by the second... Der, uh, Madam Vice Chair, to transmit to the County Council. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Um, we have a motion and a second. Is there any additional discussion? Madam Vice Chair? Vote aye. Uh, Commissioner Geraldo? I vote aye, Madam Chair. Commissioner Dorner? Vote aye. Thank you. The ayes have it 4 0. Thank you. Um, next item is item 7 which is um, specific design plan 1302-07 for Parkside. I'm doing a check. Mr. Bishop, are you on? Here, man. Mr. Antonetti, are you on? I'm here, Madam Chair. Mr. Berger, are you on? Or Ms. Stabler? Ms. Stabler is there, I see. Present. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ballion, is Mr. Ballion on, or do you? Yes, I'm on. Okay, I'm thank, on. thank you. Um, and I think Mr. Horn, is Mr. Horn on too, or no? He's not. On. You got it, Mr. Antonetti. Uh, yes, I have. I have okay, thank you. Room. And then we also have um, um, an exhibit, which is will um, is applicants' proposed revised condition, which is applicants' exhibit number one. Um, Mr. Bishop, you are on. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Board. For the record, Andrew Bishop with the Urban Design Section. Item 7 is SDP 1302-07, which is requesting the addition of four single-family attached architectural models for Haverford Homes within Sections 5 and 6 of the Parkside Development. The applicant has submitted a revised condition prior to the Wednesday deadline and is prepared to discuss this if it is the pleasure of the board. Before I begin, I would like to request to consolidate the record for the GEOs and existing location overview for items 6, 7, and 8, which are all SDPs for the same property and include architectural models for individual home builders in sections 5 and 6 of the Parkside development. Um, that's fine. We will, and we can incorporate to the extent um, um, of relevancy. And, and Mr. Antonetti, are you okay with that? Yes, that would be fine. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. All right, Mr. Bishop. Thank you. Um, slide two, please. The site is in planning area 78, Council District 6. Slide three, please. The property is located on both sides of Melwood Road at its intersection with Moore's Way. Slide 4, please. The site is in the <clears throat> RM zone and MIO zones and is bound to the north and west by other sections of the Parkside development, specifically the Central Park to the north in Section 1A to the west, south of the property, are mostly vacant properties within the MXT zone, which include the future development of the West Valley Town Center and the Moore property. 
east of the site is land in the RR zone that is part of the Marlboro Ridge residential development. Slide five, please. Further, as previously noticed, the site is within the military installation overlay zone in the noise intensity area. A condition has been included in the technical staff report requiring all residential dwellings within this zone demonstrate that interior noise levels of the residential homes will be mitigated to 45 dBA LDN or less at the time of permit. Slide 6, please. This aerial shows the subject property outlined here in red and shows that the property has been cleared, graded, and is currently under construction. Slide 7, please. The site <clears throat> is currently being developed and has been mass graded. SDP 1302-05 is currently under review and proposes a revised layout which will accommodate the architectural models proposed with this application and does not make any additional impacts to the environmental features previously approved. Slide 8, please. This slide shows the master plan rights of way near the property and include the major collectors of Woodyard Road, which run north-south and divide the site into sections 5 and 6, and shows the major collector Dower House Road, which runs east and west through section 5 and is shown in blue. Collector C856 is also shown running north and south and in green. Primary roads P613 and P619 are also seen here, which are shown in pink. Slide 9, please. This slide shows the overall park site development and highlights the location of sections 5 and 6 within the overall development which are shown here in the darker gray hatch. Slide 10, please. This exhibit shows the, the view shed from the historic Blythewood House and color codes the individual SDPs, which would be discussed today. These include SDP 1302-06 in blue, SDP 1302-07, in green and SDP 1302-08 in orange. The future application of SDP 1302-09 has not been filed and is shown on this slide in purple. Slide 11, please. The following architectural elevations were provided by Haverford Homes and show the character of the proposed buildings which are compatible with the architecture approved previously within other sections of Parkside and will be added to the mix of units available in sections 5 and 6 if approved. The facades offer optional finishes including different shades of brick, vinyl siding, and cement bore siding, bay windows, metal railings, and dormers. The slide shows the different architectural options available for the Davidson, which is a 20-foot wide rear-loaded garage model. Slide 12, please. This elevation shows the loft model, which is one of the other three single-family attached options available. The loft is a 20-foot wide single-family attached home and proposes a rear-loaded garage. Slide 13, please. The elevation shown here includes the Naples, which is a 16-foot wide single-family attached home and proposes a rear-loaded garage. Slide 14, please. The elevation shown here include the Rome, which is a 16-foot wide single-family attached home proposing a rear-loaded garage. Slide 15, please. The final slide shows the combination of the 16-foot wide dwelling units and the 20-foot wide dwelling units with the 16-foot wide models proposed on the interior of the townhouse stick and the 20-foot wide models proposed on the ends. Staff finds texture generally acceptable but is recommending conditions related to 
the architecture to maintain consistency with other sections of Parkside. The applicant has submitted a revised condition that staff has reviewed and an agreement with. In conclusion, the urban design section recommends the planning board adopt the findings of this report and approve specific design plan SDP 1302-07 subject to the conditions and findings in this technical staff report. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Let's see if there's um, any questions for you. Um, Madam Vice Chair? No questions, thank you. Um, Commissioner Dorner? Yeah, I, I just have some questions. It looks like the lighting's really nice on these units, um, but it's very difficult to see the side elevation treatments. Um, in fact, on the photo that we have up on the slide right now, on the last slide, um, it looks like there's almost none um, in, in the Davidson model. Right. the loft model as well. Um, the Naples and Rome look pretty good, but I couldn't really tell what the side treatments were on, on the brick side. And then we don't have any views on the back side. So I don't know if there's there's no treatments on the back. Um, it looks like just from the angle that there's no outside area, like no patio or anything on the deck. But could you comment about that? Because we don't yeah, have any you know, views to see that at the rear elevation. You know what? Um, um, Commissioner Dorner, thank you for raising that because I had a similar question regarding the Davidson and the loft. But it looks to me, and maybe you can, um, if you can answer Commissioner Dorner's question about the side and the back. But on the on the Davidson and the loft, it looks like right towards on the end, but right no, no, not the Naples, the Davidson and the loft, right there. It looks like there's um, there are window treatments right from the top to the bottom there. But it looks it's so narrow and on the on the end unit on. Move the no the, all the way all the way up, yeah right there, up and down. So mm -hmm. those are windows. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So so that is I. It was hard to tell initially. To the back. Okay. So that's um. So that's the Davidson and the and the loft model. So there are window treatments there. Um. And and um. Also, Mr. Bishop. Um. And maybe Mr. Antonetti, if you can, if you can address um, Commissioner Dorner's question about the rest, of the sides and maybe the other on the other end and also the back. Sure. Um, there are treatments on the side elevations. I apologize for not having those in the presentation. Um, and then, then there are also uh, windows and treatments on the rear of the homes. The sides have been conditioned um, to provide uh, high quality ele elevations where uh, deemed appropriate. But um, I can let Mr. Antonetti uh, discuss any other specific um, answers to your questions. Okay. Um, okay. Let's, okay, Mr. Dorner, before we get to Mr. Antonetti, let's see if you have any additional questions before I go to um, Commissioner Geraldo. No, that, that's it. I, I, yeah, I see the windows now on the other two units. I, I still don't see anything on the back. The maple looks like it might have something on the back side, but uh, I'll let Mr. Infinetti talk about that because we don't have anything to, to look at at all on the back areas. Okay. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Drago, any questions? No, I, I, you and Commissioner Dorner uh, addressed the issues that I had uh, with regards to the side and the back. I would like to know whether or not the dormers are functional. In other words, is there another floor? Is it there? Is it just decorative? Uh, decorative. Okay. So let's see. Um, mm -hmm. um, Let's. Why don't we have Mr. Antonetti? If there are no other questions of Mr. Bishop, let's have Mr. Antonetti um, answer the questions in his presentation. Mr. Antonetti. Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, uh, Robert Antonetti with the law firm of Shift Plain Foreign. We're pleased to be here on behalf of the applicant HWR LLC, uh, which is a subsidiary of Haverford Homes. Uh, Today with me, uh, we have Mr. Sabag Malian, President of Haverford Homes. We have Ms. Rachel Leisinger, Civil Engineer with Dewberry. Um, I guess before I, I jump into it, I do want to thank Mr. Bishop for his fine work and thorough review of this report. Uh, he's uh, incredibly accessible, incredibly responsive to comments and interactions, very willing to set up meetings at a drop of a hat. Uh, and that type of interaction is, um, is uh, especially appreciated. Uh, by uh, by me, and uh, I just want to thank him publicly for his fine work. Uh, 
Today, uh, we do seek an approval of uh, four single-family attached models for, sec for Section 6 within Parkside. Uh, the ones you have in front of you are essentially uh, uh, elevations, rendered elevations of what those would look like. They do include the Davidson, the Loft, the Naples, and the Rome. Uh, with regards to the side elevation question, um, yes, I, I, there, there were elevations black and white on all four sides of these buildings that were submitted. Um, they just, I think, were inadvertently were uh, left out of uh, this slideshow presentation. But uh, that being said, there are uh, side treatments that are proposed. For example, the loft model that is in front of us, I think, is a good example. While it's hard to see um, dimensionally from this exhibit, yeah. there's, there's at least six windows on the side here. Um, this would be a high visibility treatment. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's also uh, brick all the way up to uh, the soldier course, which is at the top right near the, uh, near the A-frame of the roof, um, in addition to the uh, different colored siding uh, up there as well. So I believe all those in total, are, you're, you're looking in the neighborhood of uh, in excess of um, probably eight treatments on the side of this, of this higher elevation unit. I apologize that it's, it's not more clear. But that is what's intended to be represented. I think some of the landscape also um, covers up some of that. Um, with regards to the loft um, or the dormer on top, uh, it depends on the unit. Um, the loft model is a, is a, is a loft, so that would be um, that, uh, you know functional um, up at the top. As you can see, um, with regards to um, this elevation on the side, you can actually see a full window on the side there as well. Um, indicating finished space up at the top uh, of that unit, and that's why the base square footage of the loft is is uh, is larger uh, than the Davidson. So uh, so yes, it depends on on what unit. Um, so it's either it either has an aesthetic function or an aesthetic and a spatial function, depending on on which elevation you're you're choosing. And the loft model it is actually a, uh, uh, that is a functional loft. Um, I do have Mr. Balian uh, on on the line. I'm not sure if there's any. Uh, anything else you'd like to add to this, or if I misstated anything regarding uh, particularly the dormer, you know, please feel free to um, the chime in, uh, Sabah. Uh, Mr. Ballian? Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. This is Sabah Ballian. I'm president of Haverford Homes, and can everyone hear me well? We can. Thank you. Um, uh, once again, thank you uh, for this presentation, and I, I, I personally want to thank the Planning Board for continuing your meetings during these difficult and challenging times. Um, it is exemplary in many ways. Um, as to the questions that are uh, before us right now, um, uh, the answer is You know what, correct, Mr. Mr. Ballian, uh, Mr. Ballian, Mr. Um, while, um, before you um, finish speaking at this point, uh, maybe Mr. Bishop. Okay. All right. So, because we're going to need you to maybe pull up what you have. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Ballion, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah. Um, some of the units, like the Naples, um, uh, the Rome, and the Loft, uh, have fourth levels. Fourth levels um, that are uh, functional. And on those fourth levels, for example, with the Naples, we have a balcony at the fourth level, along with a deck second level so it's a beautiful view from up there uh, we have a master bedroom option up there where uh, someone can have a balcony to sit on from their master bedroom and there's a very nice functioning deck at the kitchen level uh, in addition to that uh, the loft has uh, the same option as well um, I think Bob covered some of the side window treatments uh, we've always met with the high vis issues and uh, requirement for windows on the sides um, in, in all the communities that we have built uh, and the the units which we don't which don't have the loft level like the Davidson do have uh, multiple treatments in the back along with the deck so uh, we feel it needs the um, and it, you know it meets the community requirements and it uh, and um, and the standards set by Prince George's County yeah. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Bell. Uh, so, uh, uh, thank you for that clarification. Uh, so, so with that, um, Madam Chair, if, if I answered the, the questions um, that were asked in the opening presentation. Uh, we do agree with the staff's recommendations. Hold and on. The rec hold, I'm sorry. Hold, I just want to make sure I'm clear. I, I don't see our commissioner right now. So, 
Hold on a second. I got to make sure I have a quorum. So I'm still, are you talking about me, Madam Chair? Yes. Okay. Yeah, my, my laptop froze up. I'm oh. still on the Okay, got it. Okay, I, I just couldn't anything. see you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. I'm just going to reset it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, so with that, uh, we do rec uh, do agree with the staff recommendation. I will mention that there are, uh, as Mr. Bishop stated, um, are conditions that are consistently held throughout um, other sections of Parkside, particularly for attached units dealing with percentage of brick, um, the amount of uh, there's a uh, amount of side features for both low visibility and high visibility units. All those have been carried forward, um, and, and we we certainly accept those and. Uh, will meet or exceed those um, in the product that's brought before you. Uh, I would say the uh, the door space that's provided here um, can accommodate a device uh, such as a Nest or um, or one of the virtual alarms, um, given given the width uh, that that's there. So um, so that would be uh, something that could be uh, that could be utilized by a homeowner uh, without any issue here. Um, and with regards to the conditions, we only have one recommended change, uh, and it's a document that we had submitted. Um, I, I may have misheard, Madam Chair. Did, I'm not sure if it was pre-marked as Applicant's Exhibit yes. 1, but I... Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, so Applicant's Exhibit 1 is, is really a, a, a minor rewording of Condition 6, um, dealing with uh, certification of the, of the noise uh, uh, or the sound limits, uh, internal noise levels. And it would read, uh, and this is a, this language is consistent with a condition that exists in STP 100303 uh, uh, regarding uh, noise levels. It would say prior to issuance of each residential building permit for construction of a unit within the 65 dBA LDN line, plans for the building shall be certified by an acoustical engineer, stating that internal noise levels shall be 45 dBA LDN or less. Uh, again, that's language that's consistent with a, with a condition in a previous approval. Um, we feel that it's uh, it's appropriate, even though minor change. So we would appreciate your consideration of that. I believe staff uh, is in agreement with yeah. that change. I think um, Mr. Bishop so indicated. Mr. Bishop? Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, with that, uh, we would respectfully uh, uh, request your support for this application, and we appreciate your consideration. If you have any further questions of us or our team, we'd be more than happy to answer. Madam Chair, I have one question. Sure. Uh, is is Haverford offering any of the units with elevators? Uh, I would defer to uh, Mr. Valiant uh, to that question. Thank you, for, yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, these units are 20 feet wide and 16 feet wide, so there is not sufficient room to put an elevator in these units. Okay, thank you. Typically, we do those uh, with our 24 foot wide units. Okay, thank you, Mr. Valiant. No further you. questions, Madam Chair. Um, thank you. Let me turn to Mr. Bishop for a second. Mr. Bishop, um, are you in a position to share your screen to show us um, another view of the site? Um, the side elevations and the rear elevations? Um, I, I do not have those um, okay. the side elevations available at this moment, no. Or the rear? I apologize. Okay. Or the rear, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so what well, we got... Chair, in, yes. Madam Chair, in the future, can we make sure when the presentations are done yeah. that we get a full view of the units? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay, um, with that, I, there are no other speakers. Um, so unless any board members have any questions, I'm gonna entertain a motion. Madam Chair, yes. I would move that we adopt the findings of fact uh, by staff in SDP 1302-07 and the conditions of staff as modified by applicants exhibit number one. Okay, and approved. Okay, so we're, so we're uh, is there a second? Second, Madam Chair. Order second. Okay, so we have a um, motion by Commissioner Geraldo to adopt the findings of fact and approve the um, application with the conditions as modified by applicants condition number one, seconded by Madam Vice Chair. Um, I'm going to call Madam Vice Chair. Aye. Commissioner Dorner. Aye. 
Commissioner Geraldo? Vote aye, ma'am. Okay, the motion passes 4-0. Not everybody can be seen right this moment, um, but um, we have four persons, four planning board members on, on the line. And uh, Mr. Ballion, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for sharing the comments regarding the planning department and the planning board continuing to um, conduct business during this COVID environment. Um, we've, we've all worked very hard at that and thank you for recognizing that, number one. Thank you again. Okay, and um, uh, Mr. Antonetti, we thank you for sharing your positive feedback regarding Mr. Bishop. It's greatly appreciated. And while we're at it, um, we will take this opportunity to say a very happy birthday to you and to your law partner. I know you're the same day, although it's years apart. Uh, uh, happy birthday to you and your partner, Mr. Horn. Thank you. It's very sweet of you. Thank you. Greatly appreciate and, 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 and we can commend um, Emma on your haircut. Thank, thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, I think he should sing for us, Madam Chair. Ooh, yeah. okay. He should no, sing? No, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. So the next item is item 6, which is SDP 1302-06, also Parkside. Um, and we will incorporate the, the relevant portions of the record from item 7 into item 6 and, um, and item 8 when we get to it. Uh, we have Mr. Bishop. We have Ms. Stabler. Um, uh, Rachel Lightsinger? Present. Okay. Kevin Fleming? Present, Madam Chair. And we also have an applicant's exhibit number one, which are proposed revised conditions. Um, thank you. Mr. Bishop, you're on. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Board. For the record, Andrew Bishop with the Urban Design Section. Item 6 is SDP 1302-06, which requests the addition of four single-family attached architectural miles for mid-Atlantic builders within sections 5 and 6 of the Parkside development. The applicant has submitted revised conditions prior to the Wednesday deadline that's prepared and is prepared to discuss these if it is the pleasure of the board. As previously discussed, staff will be consolidating the GEOs and existing location overview for this okay. application and would like to begin with slide 11, please. Perfect. The following architectural elevations were provided by Mid-Atlantic Builders and show the character of the proposed buildings, which are generally compatible with the architecture approved previously for the application and will be added to the mix of units available. The facades offer optional finishes, including brick, stone, and cement board siding, and specialty windows, metal railings, and front porches. The slide shows the Hudson and Madison models, which are 22-foot wide, single-family attached homes, and propose a rear-loaded garage. Slide 12, please. This elevation shown here includes the other two single-family attached models, the Waverly and the Lafayette model, which are 24-foot wide single-family attached homes with a front-loaded garage. Slide 13, please. The following slides show the individual facades of the architectural treatments available for each housing model. This slide shows the 22-foot wide rear-loaded single-family attached Hudson model. Slide 14, please. This slide shows the 24-foot wide front-loaded single-family attached Lafayette model. Slide 15, please. This slide shows the 22-foot wide rear-loaded single-family attached Madison model. Slide 16, please. And lastly, this is the 24-foot wide single-family Attached Waverly model. Staff finds the architectural architecture generally acceptable, but is recommending that additional architectural features on the front elevations be used to break up the mass of the roof line and provide additional architectural interest. Staff is also recommending a number of other conditions regarding the percentage of brick treatment of the garage doors and 
groove line feature that have been conditioned to maintain consistency with sections 1, 2, and 3 of Parkside. The applicant has submitted revised conditions that staff has reviewed and is in agreement with, with the exception of condition 2 related to the percentage of brick. Staff will adjust the findings of the resolution to reflect the board's decision relative to this condition. In conclusion, the urban design section recommends the planning board adopt the findings of this report and approve specific design plan 1302-06 subject to the conditions and findings in the technical staff report. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if there are any questions of Mr. Bishop at this time. Okay, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, just a clarification on his exception to uh, number two, the recommendation number two. I did not hear the full explanation. Uh, <clears throat> Bishop. Yes, um, we're not in full agreement with condition number two because uh, condition number two is related to the percentage of brick uh, 27 for ADC. Um, states that townhouses shall have a minimum of 60 percent um, full front facades in brick, stone, or stucco. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Commissioner Dorner? You're muted. Hold on a second. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so I, I have a few questions. Is there any, or are there any side and back elevations or improvements? Because we don't have anything in the slides. And then also on the front loading garages, what's the rationale for that? Because typically we've been doing rear loading garages on most of these units. So I just want to make sure there's not a whole like stick that they're all front loading that it might be like a corner unit or something like that. I, I do have, um, I can not share my screen to show the side elevations of this model um, and I'm available to do that. Uh, there are a number of sticks that are entirely front loaded. Uh, But are, are these all front loading sticks or, or what, how is the kind of split up with that? Mm -hmm. So there, there are sticks of front loaded and there are sticks of rear loaded homes and that all of the homes in the stick are, are all one, one housing type. Um, can you expand on, on, the, on your question? Yeah, a little bit. It, it's just, it's hard to, to visualize when we only have like separate units right here. It's hard to visualize like if there's a stick of like eight of them or something that if, if all of them have the front loading kind of where they are locationally. Because typically we don't usually have people just pulling right into the front of their houses. We have like kind of back alleyways and townhomes and, and people pull into the back. And then if there is a front loading unit, it's usually on like the a corner or some sort of like odd configuration that that doesn't have for the rest of the stick um, front loading units um i think if we go to to slide uh 10 that would show the location of these units uh these units are uh the 06 which is um shown in blue so it's the the units that are closest to the blythewood house um, then mostly side on, uh, show the sides of the units towards the Blythewood house. Um, and there's no way to zoom in on this. Um, You can, you can see in this slide that, that there are 
broken up into individual sticks that are, are front loaded. Um, and then there are there are reloaded homes as well. In the same right. stick? No, 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 not not in the same stick. But okay. different they're, they're proposed in different configurations. Um, is there any way to to blow up that image? You might be able to get like control in like the scroll wheel to kind of zoom in. Otherwise, I, I think there is a zoom like on the right hand side kind of control. Okay. At least we have it on, on our end. Mr. You, you Mr. Flanagan is, is operating it here in, in the in the um, hearing room. So um, he's he's trying. I can zoom in individually. Um, good morning, everyone. This is Jill Kozak. Um, this uh, SCP the, for the infrastructure with the lot arrangement for um, rear and front load townhomes was approved previously by the board. Um, I believe there's a total of 567 townhomes within um, Parkside sections five and six. And, you know, it is a mix of front load sticks and rear load sticks. Um, I know Rachel, Rachel Leitz Leitzinger, excuse me, uh, the engineer is on the line. And she can maybe confirm um, what's the number of front load units um, and sticks and what's the number of rear load units and sticks. But that um, combination and arrangement had been previously approved by the board through SCP-1302-03. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Kozak, do we have images of, of the rears of the units when they are rear loaded? Because we're not, the, as with the prior presentation, we can't sort of just imagine what they look like. It, um, it, it's kind of hard to tell until we see it, and we don't have any real, we don't have any side views yes. on the treatment. So it's it's hard to approve something if we don't know what it looks like um, in different directions. Yes, I, I'm sorry for that exclusion. We did not have... Um, rendered elevations from the applicant, but we do have black and white elevations of the rear and the sides. And I believe Andrew is prepared to share his screen uh, to show those. But and again, it, I apologize. Thank, for the thank you, Ms. Kosek. Thank you, Ms. Kosek. And if, and if um, Mr. Bishop can share his screen, that would be helpful. Or um, um, Ms. Leitzinger should probably have it as well. Okay, so we, do we want to start with Mr. Bishop? Yes, I have those available. Um, the organizer needs to give me. He's, he's doing uh, that right now. Okay. okay, thank you. And Ms. Leisinger, while Mr. Bishop is doing this, if you have something to show us that, you know, let us know. Okay. Good morning. I, I do have things available. If, if need be, I can share my screen as well. Okay. Do you have the same thing that Mr. Bishop is showing us now, or do you have something that, that's more illustrative? No, I have the, the same black and white okay. elevations okay. that okay. Mr. Bishop has. Okay. Okay. I see the rear. Okay, that's a lot. That's a lot more helpful than mm -hmm. having that. Okay. Thank you, the, um, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Dwanner, um You were still. Um, you still had the floor. Do you still have additional questions? No, I'm, I'm fine. I, I wanted to see what what's being shown right now, so that that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Geraldo. Um, no, that's helpful. I do have a question as to whether or not any of the 24 units are going to offer elevators. Leitzinger or Mr. Let, let, why don't we wait till we have I think our questions now are of, of um, Mr. Bishop let's turn to the to Ms. Leitzinger um, do you have any question, other questions of Mr. Bishop no okay I, I appreciate the, uh, the showing the, the rears and sides thank you okay. thank you so so um, Mr. Flanagan you want to take it back and then um, Ms. Leitzinger 
Good morning, Madam Chair uh, and members of the board. Uh, for the record, this is Rachel Weitzinger with Dewberry uh, here on behalf of the applicant Mid-Atlantic Builders. Um, I have been asked by uh, Mid-Atlantic Builders to present to you today. Um, and I am joined today with uh, Kevin Fleming, who is a Vice President of Land Acquisitions with Mid-Atlantic Builders. Um, first, to answer a couple questions that were asked for Section 6, um, which is where these, this architecture is proposed. There are 183 rear-loaded townhomes proposed and 100 front-loaded townhomes proposed. Um, Mid-Atlantic is proposing the uh, four models presented to you today. Um, they provide, as you can see, um, you know, multiple features on the sides and the rears, uh, such as windows and optional decks. Um, regarding the elevations, I mean, sorry, the elevators, I would like to defer to Kevin Fleming to answer that question. Uh, Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Commissioner Geralda, at this time, there are no plans to offer elevators in any of our product. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, so that was it. Um, um, okay, that was it for you, um, Commissioner Geraldo. Um, Ms. Leisinger, any, okay, you have some other, Ms. Leisinger, you want to continue? Um, yes, we have some proposed revisions to conditions that I would like to present. The one, um, these, are, are these revisions to your applicant's exhibit number one, or are you referring to applicant's exhibit number one? Uh, referring to applicant's exhibit okay. number one. Okay. Was, uh, submitted to the, okay. to the board. Um, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Bishop and Ms. Kozak um, for meeting with us. They met with Mr. Fleming okay. and I earlier this week to go over these conditions, and um, as always, they are very helpful, and um, we appreciate that. Um, so first, um, condition 1C, um, we would like to remove the language regarding reverse gables or dormers on the roofs. Ms. Weisinger, um, let me stop you for a second. Um, um, Mr. Bishop, did you indicate that the, what, the condition that you had a problem with was for um, condition two? It, it was for condition two. Everything else, yeah, we, we're, we're in agreement. Okay, right? we have we have the rest of it, Miss Miss Leisinger. Okay, so, so I just need to talk about condition right. two then. Correct. Okay, um, so the the applicant would like to propose the addition of the sentence. The requirement this requirement may be reduced to fifty percent full brick or other masonry front facade if cement siding is used on the non brick slash masonry front elevations, and this is because the um, front elevations proposed by Mid-Atlantic do not contain any vinyl siding, um, any, you know, non-brick or masonry feature is cement siding. So they are just requesting that since none of the vinyl siding is proposed, that their uh, requirement be reduced to 50% um, in this case. They, they think that they are going to have a high demand by um, buyers for the cement siding option, and if the requirement is 60%, then they won't be able to provide that as often as it is requested. Okay. What? So I understand oh. what you're, you're saying. If, if you have the cement siding, what you're saying is you, if you have the cement siding, um, you will then not be able to provide the, um, the um, full brick um, wait a minute. No, there's, I, I don't there's full brick okay. options as well. Okay. It's just that with the requirement being 60%, then they don't, you know, that limits the amount of the cement, cement siding okay. options okay, got that it. they can Okay, use. got it. Okay. So they just want to reduce the requirement so okay. that they can use the cement siding more if the buyers okay. request that. Okay, and Mr. Bishop, you disagree with that. That is correct. And can you restate Mr. your Madam Chair? Can you restate your reason? Yes. Who, who's speaking? This is Peter Goldsmith, Senior Counsel. I okay. uh, okay. just want to elaborate. Uh, I believe Mr. Bitt said that um, the the, um, the proposed condition conflicts with the code, and I just want to read that code section to the okay. board. Okay. Uh, that would be helpful. It's 
It's um, section 27480, which are the general development regulations for comprehensive design zones. And this is in the comprehensive design zone in the RM zone. And part section C says a minimum of 60% of all townhouses, houses, townhouses constructed in the comprehensive design zones, the specific design plan for which an application is filed after December 30th, 1996, which this is, mm -hmm. shall have a full front facade excluding gables, bay windows, trim, and doors, constructed of brick, stone, or stone. And so if the board um, is looking to adopt uh, the applicant's proposed exhibit, it would have to uh, make the finding that um, the proposed uh, concrete siding uh, falls within the category of brick, stone, or stucco. Okay. So thank you. The board you. Have could do so. Thank you so much, Mr. Goldsmith. Um, so, Ms. Leisinger, I, I am not going to, you're not rep, I don't think you're represented by counsel here today, and I'm not going to ask you to respond to a legal argument because that, that, that's prohibited. So, um, we have your position, and we have the, we have the law as read into the record by um, our uh, senior counsel, Mr. Goldsmith, and the, the finding, um, um, the rest will be up to the board at this juncture. Um, okay, so um, Ms. Leisinger, anything else? Um, no, uh, that is it. Um, I thank you for your time. I don't know if Mr. Fleming wants to add anything um, to this. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, Madam Chair, just for a little more uh, background on the request to lower the requirement for brick. We, we, we believe that the siding elevations based on our current experiences in the county is becoming a very preferred style of architecture. And so in developing the architecture for this section of Parkside, we've made significant changes to the style and the presentation with a more urban contemporary look. And we felt that by moving to a cement siding we were going to be able to offer more choice both within the community relative to the other builders and also consistent with what we've been seeing so our, our request is we understood we understood the code our request is that we just see a trend in the marketplace towards more siding style elevations that offers a little more flexibility in the color palette and in, in the look and so we were just looking at this from the perspective that we think we might have more customers um, that might request siding, and so that's why we had made the request. I think in the total of the project, I think it moves the number from total brick elevations to from 70, I think it's about 12 houses total is what would it really be impacted, which, which, which could be sided versus full brick. So that's the, the background on uh, why we made the request. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fleming, for that. Um, sure. Um, I think I think we still have a dilemma with regard to the the legal um, um, provision that was added into the code. Um, uh, Commissioner Geraldo, I do have a question. What exactly is meant by cement siding? So cement siding uh, is is a hard product. Uh, Hardy board tends to be kind of a brand that's used in the market, but it's it's a non vinyl product. It is a hard surface product. Is it is it like dry bit? No, it is not like drive it. That that is more of a stucco driven product. This is truly a a solid uh, uh, cement type material. So it uh, it's more like it, it's kind of a modern version of, of the old wood clapboards, but only it's used with a cement based product. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, um, okay, so that concludes the questions of the board and um, Okay, so I think that covers all of our speakers. Um, Madam Chair, can I just ask you a quick question about sure. the, the cement um, choice? Do we have like in the slides of, I mean, you know, the applicant isn't really leaving us in, the, in a good position because we're not a legislative body and the code says, says a very particular thing. I, I'm wondering if we have an, anything in the slides that would show us where the cement is um in relationship to the brick um and whether or not that would be that would resemble stucco or stone 
facades um, that we have elsewhere in the county. Because right now, um, I, I don't think they're making a very compelling case. I don't. It, can you return to the slide that shows the elevations? Uh, so, all right. So, so in this in this slide, what you what you'll it, see hold on, hold on. Can, uh, please Sorry. identify yourself again, because the number of people have uh, been speaking. Then, Ms. Mr. My, Fleming. My, my apologies, Madam Chair. Kevin Fleming with Mid Atlantic okay. Builders. Okay. Um, so, in this strip of six homes. The two interior homes that are here in the mm -hmm. grayish white color reflect the cement siding. Uh, we are showing a brick water table at the bottom with uh, siding going up on the first and the second level and then a change in color of the siding on the third level. So that would be the second, the second one from the, from the left and the second one from the right. Okay. That, that's okay. correct. Okay. okay. Thank you. Commissioner so, am I, oh. I, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Go ahead. So if what you're suggesting is that the cement siding is made to look like clapboard, is that it? That's mm -hmm. correct. Okay. <clears throat> okay, does the board have any other questions before we call for a motion? No questions. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Dorner? No, ma'am. Commissioner Geraldo? No, ma'am. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, <clears throat> uh, this is Commissioner Geraldo. Uh, I would move that we adopt the findings of staff SDP-1302-06 uh, with the uh, proposed revised conditions as set forth in applicant's exhibit number one with the exception of condition two uh, with regards to the uh, uh, full brick or other masonry facade, we got the findings of fact commission and, and findings of staff along with those revised conditions in exhibit one, except for number two. We have a motion. Is there a second? Is that Commissioner Dorner? Okay, a yes, second. A second by Commissioner Dorner. Okay. Um, uh, Madam Vice Chair, let me let me make sure I'm okay. So. I got the motion. Let me make sure that I understand, uh, Mr. The motion, Madam Chair. Yeah. In regards to number two. Yeah. To number two would uh, go back to I, number two would be as staff. It would be staff's condition number two, not as staff condition. Right. Okay. 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 That's that's what I wanted to be clear. Yeah. All right. But the rest of it would be as amended. The the the, the remaining mm -hmm. conditions yeah. one C and F and four and six would be as amended in applicants exhibit number one, but number two would remain as, as staff. Um, as staff. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. So Good. we have a motion and a second. Right. Is there additional discussion? Madam Vice Chair? Vote aye. Um, Commissioner Dorner? Vote aye. Commissioner Geraldo? I vote aye. The ayes have it 4-0. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, you know what, we're going to take item eight at this point, and then we're going to take a 10 minute break and then come back and resume with, um, items, um, nine and then item three A. So right now we're going to item eight. Um, and then let me make sure, um, okay. So item eight, item eight, we have, um, Mr. Bishop again, we have, um, uh, Rachel, Mr. Bishop, you're still on. Ms. Stabler, Dr. Stabler, you're still on, right? Okay. Yes. Okay, Rachel Leitzinger, you're still on, right? Correct. Okay, um, and now we have Keith Tunnell. Tunnell, yes, here. Um, thank you. And that um, and that concludes the sign-up list. And then we have, again, applicants exhibit number one, applicants proposed revised condition. Okay, Mr. Bishop, you're on, and we're incorporating the pertinent part of the record, um, um, the overview into um, the record for SDP 1302-08 Parkside. Mr. Mr. Bishop. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the mm -hmm. Planning Board. For the record, Andrew Bishop with the Urban Design Section. Item 8 is SDP 1302-08, which requests the addition of six single-family attached 
and seven single family detached architectural models for Dan Ryan builders was sec within sections five and six of the Parkside development. <clears throat> the applicant has submitted a revised, a revised condition prior to the Wednesday deadline and is prepared to discuss this if it is the pleasure of the board. As discussed, that will be consolidated the GEOs and existing location overview slide for this application, which you please skip to slide 11. The following architectural elevations were provided by Dan Ryan Builders to show the character of the six proposed single family attached and seven proposed single family detached buildings. The 13 models for, will be added to the mix of units available in sections five and six if approved. The proposed single family detached houses feature gabled roofs, dormers, and high quality building materials such as vinyl, shingle shake, brick, stone, and cement board siding. They also include metal railings, balconies, front porches, and options for front and side garages. The proposed single family houses feature gabled roofs, dormers, and high quality building material. This slide shows the different architectural op options available for the Alden 2, which is a 16 foot rear loaded garage model. Slide 12, please. The elevation shown here includes the Ashton 2 model, which is one of the single family detached models available from Dan Ryan Builders. Slide 13, please. The elevation shown here include the Camden 2 model, which is a 20 foot wide rear loaded single family detached home. Slide 14, please. This slide shows the Castle Rock 2 model, which is one of the single family detached models available. Slide 15, please. The other one here is the Cumberland 2 model, which is one of the single family detached homes in this application. Oh, okay. Slide 16, please. The single, this slide shows the single family attached home, our single, yeah, single family attached home, the Davenport, which includes a 22 foot wide product with a front load garage. Slide 17, please. The elevator here includes the Emory 2 model, which is a single family detached home available in both sections 5 and 6 of Parkside. Slide 18, please. The elevation shown here includes the Grable 2, which is a 24 foot wide front loaded single family attached home. Slide 19, please. These elevations are of the Harlow 2 model, which is another 22 foot wide front loaded single family attached home. Slide 20, please. The elevation shown here is the Montgomery 2 model, which is a single family detached home. Slide 21, please. The elevation, this is the elevation for the single family detached model, the Newberry 2 and is shown here. Slide 22, please. The elevation for the single family detached model, the Oakdale 2, is shown here. Slide 23, please. The final slide shows the 22 foot wide rear loaded single family attached Oakton 2 model. Staff finds the architectural generally acceptable but is recommending conditions. Recommended for the the architecture to maintain consistency with other sections of Parkside. The applicant has submitted revised conditions that staff has reviewed and is in agreement with. I'm prepared to show the board black and white elevations of the side and rear if it is the pleasure of the board. Um, we may want to see that and let's and thank goodness you have condition six in there because looking at these side elevations we're you know they're devoid of, of, of features for some of them. But um, I'm looking at the Emory model and the Castle Rock model. It seems to have a window. And the Cumberland, too. Yeah, I don't really see anything on the side there. Um, was that it for you, Mr. Bishop? 
Um, in conclusion, the okay. design section recommends the planning board adopt the findings of this report and approve specific design plan SDP 1302-08 subject to the conditions and findings in the technical staff report. This concludes staff's presentation. Um, Mr. Bishop, you. You, you made it, thank you. You made an offer to show the side elevation, so let's do that because it's going to mm -hmm. come up. So we're going to allow you to do that, okay. Madam Chair, is there a specific elevation you'd like to look at? Well, I'm sure I'm sure others have um, questions, but I'd like to see the Emory, and I'd like to start with let's start with um, Cumberland too. Yeah, all of them. Yeah, but I definitely want to start with the with Cumberland. Cumberland. Or in whatever order you have it, whatever sequence you have there, that's okay. This is the Alden. See, I'm looking at the um, right now. I'm looking at the single family, detached. The single family. Yeah. Detached. Okay. Here is the Emory map. Okay. I guess I'm okay. I'm looking. I was looking at slide um, fifteen. That's mm -hmm. okay. And actually, fourteen and seventeen. Okay. Well, let me see if the board has any questions of you. Let me start there. Madam Vice Chair, any questions? And no questions at this time. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Dorner? No questions, but I, I want to see the same things. And, and as a sort of a suggestion to applicants or, or even staff, to the extent that you can take those front views, like the Emory looks really good, but you can't see anything on the sides, are they? You can just have the people rotate it just slightly. We could get a view of both the front and, and at least one of the side elevate, um, treatments, and that would be really helpful in the future so we don't have to kind of be going back and forth. But I would like to see that the treatments, particularly on the single family units like the Cumberland too, that don't look like they have anything on, on the sides. <clears throat> So, um, this, this is Keith with the uh, Dan Ryan Builders, Keith Tunnell, Director of Land. Mm -hmm. is, is it for me to talk now, or do I need to wait to get to the next? Well, you might, um, you might want to wait a I second and, and, and do to the discussion okay, on the side. Okay, okay, but hold on a second, because we want to ask some questions. And and do you have and and is it, do you have something, uh, Mr. Tunnell, that you can visual, show us, or are you are going to just merely discuss? Uh, it was just going to explain the nature of the renderings you're seeing, little colored elevations versus, you know, what what will really get built. Um, okay. We uh, we try not to show you every you know a bunch of windows on the sides because they can have a lot of windows, but some people may not choose them, and we're afraid to kind of propose to you in a couple of colored elevations more than what might be there. So we try to you know, kind of underplay the sides and let the architecture of the black whites stand for these are all the options that people can choose okay uh, well you succeeded we, because you give us because the cumberland and in, 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 in on slide 15 it doesn't show a whole boatload of windows it shows as far as i can tell it shows zero windows in the cumberland but okay all right um we're gonna let me figure out let me allow for our uh, board members to ask questions of mr bishop at this time and then we'll turn to you all to elaborate on on anything you care to elaborate on okay fair enough okay um so um uh, commissioner dorner did you have additional questions 
Yeah, my, my other question is just going to be on, on the townhome units, the same as what I've asked in the past um, two other cases. What what does it look like behind behind the units? Because we I can't tell if there's a porch. It looks like there is some on the black and whites, um, but I can't tell if there's like a porch on the top or, or what the back side looks like. This particular unit has a, 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 an area, a patio up top. Yes. Yes, he is now. Yeah. Right now you're going to the, the, the attached units, right? I, I, I am. Okay. And then here, here's the rear of that unit uh, with the rear loaded garage. Um, this is a, this is up top. Would you like me to go yes. to another? Yeah, I guess I want, well, Commissioner Dwarner. Yeah, so I, I would like to see all the town, just all the townhome units that are attached, um, just the, the back sides of them just real quick, just to kind of get an idea. I mean, if they're all the same, that's fine, you can just say that, but I just wanted to flip through them just to see them real quick. It, it looks like they, have, they all have different options. Um, this is another rear loaded option, and it, it has the, uh, a loft on top and a single loaded garage. This is from a different application. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. So I think it's the front of the Harlow's, right? Do we have a, a rear rear view of it? Right here. Right. We're trying to not flip too fast. Flip the side. Again, that's that's okay. fine on the, the attached units. I, I think we still want to hear from the applicant afterwards about the side treatments on the single family detached units. Yeah. Um, but that that's all my questions. Thank you. And then and and also we have a condition on, on that, so which is good. Item six. But um, uh, Ms. Commissioner Geraldo, do you have any other questions? No. Uh, you and uh, Madam Chair and Commissioner Dorner address the issues I was concerned about. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, with that, now we can turn to um, Ms. Ms. Uh, whoever wants to present Ms. Weitzinger or Mr. Tunnel. 
Uh, well, this is Keith Tanel, Director of Land and Ryan Builder, so I guess I'll, uh, I'll, I'll address you all. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Planning Board. Um, can we go to a side elevation of this, whatever we're looking at right now? Go to a side elevation of it. There you go. Oh, um, yeah. oh your pick one is not great. Um, I just wanted to point the number of the ones that you saw, you would see like in this one, the window on the top is kind of shadowed in. It's not, you know, the windows that are shown on this side elevation are not all going to be there. You can get the bay window, you can get two windows, you can get the one below, you get the one above. And so when we send off to one of these rendering people to color up a nice front, uh, you know, to kind of give a sense of what these buildings look like, they just go with the one required standard window on the side. They don't show all the different optional ones, and people will choose optional ones. And and if there's a condition, then we're going to force somebody to choose optional ones until we get up to whatever the condition is, and then they can get whatever it is they want beyond that. So that's why on some of these colored renderings, it's trying to give you a sense of what the front looks like. Don't don't take it so literally the fact that they only show one window on the side because it's kind of you know. I don't want to show you five windows on the side and we only do three, you know, I kind of, I, you know, we, we don't want to over promise. Uh, so we kind of rely on the black and white uh, drawings for what, what all the options are. And we definitely meet the requirements that you all may give us for the number of uh, features that are required on the sides. Um, Dan Ryan Builders was the first builder in Parkside. We built the first home in Parkside. We've been in Parkside ever since. Uh, and so, a lot of architecture, mostly what you're seeing today, you've already approved in other sections and very happy to be bringing it forward into this section. Uh, I've had a chance to out to Parkside and see all that's out there. All the builders are doing a great job, and so we're very proud to be in this community, and we're very proud of how it's coming together. And we're going to be proud of this architecture, too, uh, uh, provided you all uh, you know, approve it. I think the only new townhome architecture we're providing here is 16 foot wide townhomes because we haven't done actually the back we have done 16 foot so we've approved the rear load 16 foot on the other side so the harlow and the grave are the only ones the 22 foot wide front load and the 24 foot wide front load which are essentially the same floor plans just two feet different um and then i think we've only added one single family detached model it's new the ashton um some of these lots are a little narrow and so we wanted to bring in a little narrower product that would be able to fit on them but the architecture we're providing and offering here is very much in keeping we're the same as what's already been approved and built and provide you go through there and you like what's built over there i think you'll like what's built here there were uh, two conditions that uh, uh, we were proposing to get uh, modified um, Condition number five and condition number six. Condition number six, you already modified earlier to, today uh, that had to do with the uh, the sound certification requirement. Um, and, and the only change there was to may, merely make it only apply to the units that are in the sound zone. So if it's not in the sound zone, you wouldn't need to get it certified. Perfect sense. And that was the rewording. And that's the rewording proposed on number eight. Uh, in, our proposed changes here. The only other was to uh, item number five that required a certain number of rooftop elements depending on the number of units that were in the stick. Uh, it cut off at four or five in a stick, but in this section there's a little bit more. There are, uh, I'm sorry, it cut off five or six units in a stick, and we actually have, I think, a seven stick, maybe an eight stick. Uh, and so we assume that you didn't mean that we didn't have to do any rooftop elements if it went to the earth, so we just changed from five to six to four units. That's what it was covered. But other than that, we're happy to comply with all the other staff proposed recommendations. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Tunnell. Let's see if there's any questions of you. Madam Vice Chair? No questions. Commissioner Dorner? No, thank you. Commissioner Geraldo? Just one clarification okay. of the record. Mr. Tunnell was talking about revisions to condition five and six, but it's actually five and eight. Oh, 
Correct. I'm sorry. Yeah. Correct. Correct. My, my eyes aren't what they used to be. You're right. That's five and eight. Should have put on the glasses. Thank you. And I have one question for Mr. Tunnell. Are any of the townhouse units offering, as an option, any elevators? Uh, no, sir, we don't. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, and Mr. Bishop, you're, you're, can you reiterate for the record where you are on the five and eight? We are in agreement with okay. the revised language. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, we're ready for a motion. Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Geraldo. I move that we uh, adopt uh, SPP 1302-08 with the findings of staff and staff's conditions as revised by applicants exhibit number one. We have a motion. Second. Seconded by Madam Vice Chair. Um, Madam Vice Chair. But I. Commissioner Dorner. Commissioner Geraldo? Vote aye, ma'am. The, um, the ayes have it 4-0. With that, we're going to take about a 10-minute recess. We'll come back at 12 noon um, for item 9 and then for item 3A. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For item 9? Present, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, again, this is um, 4 20014, the Hubbard College Park. Mr. Tedesco, are you on? Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. I'm on. Okay, good. Mark Juba, are you on? Sure, am, Madam Chair. Wonderful. Tom Masog, are you on? Uh, present, Madam Chair. Wonderful. Noel Smith? Hi. Um, Ivy Thompson? I'm here. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to go down uh, this list here. Um, Mark Go mm, Gohassen, you can correct me. I know I'm butchering this name. Um, that Mark Gohassen, you got it corrected. You got it corrected. Yes, I'm present. Okay, can you say it again for me? Gohassen. Okay, Gohassen. Okay, I did get it right. Okay, thank you. Joshua yep. Patterson. Present. Okay, wonderful. David Bickle. Present. Josh Mings. Wonderful. Okay, Josh Mings, I see you're muted here. But you're on. Okay, wonderful. Um, Chip, <laughs> Chip Shell? I'm here. Um, good. Jeff Salisco? Present. Mike Lenhart? Present. Terry Shum? Terry's not here, but I'll be representing the City of College Park. This is Miriam Bader. Okay, Mi Miriam Bader is great. Uh, that's great. Okay, so we have no other speakers on this matter. Okay, uh, and we have three. Yeah, ma yes, Madam Chair, uh, just point of order. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to acknowledge um, Ms. Tracy Skinner uh, with the General Counsel's Office from the University of Maryland is on. Unfortunately, she did not sign up in time. So um, two of the lots as part of this are. are um, owned by the University of Maryland. She understands that she can't be heard today, but we did speak this morning. So I do have her proxy and as much as that's necessary. And they did, and the university did submit a letter, which is in your backup. But I did want to at least acknowledge. Okay, we can that do she, that, but, but she can't be on, you know, she can watch, she can do whatever, but we have a procedure and, um, um, and you have to sign up in time. It's announced, it's on our website. We announce it regularly um, every week. Um, so, um, I appreciate that, and to the extent that you want to refer to any of her her um, comments, that's fine. But um, um, I have read the, the participants for this uh, case already. Um, yeah, she's she's aware of that. We understand that, and okay. uh, we appreciate that, and we'll abide by those uh, guidelines and requirements. I just wanted to just acknowledge that. Yes. I appreciate you allowing me to do that. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. But okay. So she's on, let me figure this out. She's on, it's just ob observing. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, we have three exhibits um, because technically I don't know how she got the hearing information. That's what was my real question, but okay. Because okay, um, that's not allowed, but okay. Um, so we have three exhibits. We have applicants exhibit number one, 
proposed revisions to conditions, and then we have the City of College Parks recommendations and the University of Maryland letter of support for the revised conditions. So all that's great. Okay. Um, thank you. And we have, and, and as a matter um, of principle, I announce these, these rules every week because it gets crazy and pe other people do try to sign up and we, we are hard and fast with these regulations because we, ha we have to apply them evenly. Um, thank you. Um, okay, Mr. Heath, you're on. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, I'm Antoine Heath with the Subdivision and Zoning Section. The project before you is Preliminary Plan of Subdivision, the Hubbard College Park, 4-20014. The subject property is the site of 12 existing multifamily dwelling units, which are to be raised and replaced with 161 multifamily dwelling units and 1,022 square foot commercial space on a 0.72 acre park. Next slide, please. The site is located in the northern portion of French Georgia County. Area 66 and Council District 6. Next slide, please. More specifically, the site is located on Knox Road, uh, east of the section with Gilford Drive and abuts the University of Maryland campus to the north. Next slide, please. The subject site is located in the MUI mixed use infill zone. It's bounded to the east and west within property. Uh, west properties who share the same zone. The University of Maryland campus to the this zone is all residential and the adjacent zones are multi-family high residential and one family detached residential. Next slide please. The subject site is also located within the central US one corridor sector plan and section on map development overlay district and aviation policy area six. Next slide please. The aerial photograph shown uh, shows the site in its current condition, the abutting properties to the north and south, as well as the adjacent properties, which are primarily residential. Next slide, please. The site map shows the topography gradually sloping uphill from north to south. Next slide, please. This is a bird's eye view of the site and the existing residential dwellings to be raised. Next slide, please. The master plan right-of-way map shows Gilford, the collector right-of-way, to the west of the site. Next slide, please. Critical intersections are identified in the slide and are further detailed in the staff report on page 7. When analyzed with the property development, these intersections will operate at adequate level levels. Next slide, please. The preliminary plan of subdivision provides the current conditions. All of the existing structures are to be removed and the site of access from access from Knox Road to the south. Adequate public facilities, including police, water, and sewer facilities are available to serve the subject site. The applicant has requested a variation from section 24-122A, which pertains to the required 10-foot public utility easement along Knox Road. Staff recommends approval of the variation as it would not have the effect of nullifying the end and purpose of the subdivision regulations. Next slide, please. In order to address all site improvement requirements, the applicant, in coordination with the City of College Park, has proposed to upgrade 750 linear feet of sidewalk along the south side of Guilford Road. This is highlighted in yellow. Next slide, please. Staff recommends that the planning board adopt the findings and approve plan preliminary plan of subdivision 4 20014 and variation request 24 122A, subject to the 11 conditions in the staff report. The University of Maryland has submitted a letter supporting the applicant's proposed revisions to the conditions, which can both be found in the additional backup, and staff is in agreement with these revisions. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, Mr. Heath. Um, are there any questions, Madam Vice Chair? No questions, Madam Chair. Okay, Commissioner Dorner? No, no questions. Uh, Commissioner Geraldo? No questions. Thank you. 
Um, okay, Mr. Tedesco, you're on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the Planning Board, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be before you. Um, just by way of introduction, I know, uh, Madam Chair, I know you went through this the attendees list, but I just wanted to recognize them again, um, in particular because, as, as you know, I'm representing the applicant core campus manager, uh, also known as Core Spaces. This is Core Spaces' first project uh, in Maryland, uh, first project obviously in Prince George's County. Uh, they, although based in other areas, primarily based out of Chicago, uh, Mr. Mark Ohausen and uh, Chip Shell from Core Spaces is on the line with us. We also have David Biggle and uh, with Soltes, who I know you know well, Mike Lenhart with Lenhart Traffic and Consulting. And then we have the um, architectural team from Antunovich and Associates, Mr. Jeff Salisco, Joshua Patterson, Josh Mings. Um, and as I mentioned previously, and, and I thank you for allowing my indul the indulgence to introduce Tracy Skinner, who understands cannot participate. Um, also with us, we have Ms. Marion Bader from the city of College Park. Um, and so we thank all of them for joining. Uh, before I get into my presentation, which I will try to make brief, uh, I do want to acknowledge Mr. Antoine Heat. Um, I believe this is our first case that didn't come to you as a continuance. I think I've had a, a couple of with him that have resulted in continuances. No fault of his own, I will mention. But so I think this is our first case together uh, at the planning board, if I'm not mistaken. And I just wanted to compliment Mr. Heath on his um, not only his engagement, but his review, uh, his staff report, which I was very impressed with. Um, as you can tell from our exhibits, uh, we don't have very major revisions. Um, I dare say they're not overly substantive, given just where we are. Most of them are just cleanup items from things that have evolved over the process of reviewing this plan. So um, very impressed with um, his presentation this morning or this afternoon, as well as the staff report. And I just wanted to thank him publicly. I look forward to doing more projects um, with him as we move forward. Um, Madam Chair, again, as I mentioned, this is CORE's first project. Uh, CORE Spaces is a vert vertically, vertically integrated developer, owner, and operator of assets in educational markets. What that means is they do high-end multi, uh, multi-family and student housing projects in and around in and around very large universities. Uh, Tracy, I'm sorry. This is okay. Somebody's talking in the middle of Mr. Tedesco's presentation. Okay. <laughs> I think that it sounded like Mr. Bishop, but I won't fault him for that. Okay. Um, but um, no, I, I appreciate that. So um, their assets run, you know, coast to coast from California, Oregon. Uh, Arizona and over to the, the East Coast in Virginia uh, and Pennsylvania, Florida, Georgia. And as I mentioned, this is their uh, one in, first one in our jurisdiction. So it's my pleasure and, and honor to be representing a, a new developer within our county. Um, and we are very excited. I'm also very proud to represent a client who, for the past seven years running, uh, if not eight years running, has received multiple awards in uh, various categories uh, awards to and include um, from the stu student student housing business innovator um, as i understand it uh, that is kind of the, the the golden globes or the the oscars of student housing projects as far as rankings and um, i can actually what i will do probably next week is next week we will have the detailed site plan for this application i will probably have a slide that provides some of those awards and acknowledgements but let me tell you, they're quite impressive and thorough. Um, and again, seven or eight years running, they have received an award for various projects throughout the country. Um, so we are very happy and honored to have them in Prince George's County at the University of Maryland within the city of College Park. Um, I don't have a lot more to, to add uh, beyond that. We are certainly uh, in agreement with the staff's recommendations, certainly with respect to the staff's recommendation for the variation requests, which is in your staff report at pages 14 and 17. Um, we worked, and I want to acknowledge Ms. Bader, we worked very closely as you would expect, um, and everyone uh, has come to know within the City of College Park, working very closely with both her and Ms. Shum, as well as the Mayor and the City Council, and um, we appear before you this afternoon with their full support. They, do, they did have some recommendations of conditions which have been adopted into your staff report, which we uh, agree with. And next week, as I mentioned, we will be before you on the detailed site plan and we can get into uh, the really excited aspects of the project, which is what it looks like. Um, so with that, Madam Chair, we do have the applicant's exhibit one, um, which has 
fairly minor requested revisions. One to a finding as it relates to just a typographical error, and then some revisions to two conditions. And I can blow through those really, really quickly or not, whatever you choose. Okay, so right now, I know Mr. Heath said they're in agreement. So right now, item seven was just a mistake? Is that what it is? Yeah, so there was a typo in the case number on the table, and then the number of beds is 477. It doesn't change anything substantively in the table, but we just, you know, that's probably something that could have been done in the resolution, but we just figured it was. That's fine, that's fine. Okay, and number two is being deleted. Number two is being deleted. 2A is supported by the University of Maryland's letter. They are not supportive of doing the sharrows, and they intend to gate off that portion of Lehigh. So at best, it'll be a service road, a minimal service, and that's articulated quite well in their letter. And so with that staff, we have requested that 2A be deleted, which staff agreed with. And then 2B is only being requested to be deleted because with the DSP close on the heels of this one, the DSP already shows that crosswalk, and so there was no need to have that condition on the preliminary plan. It's already in your DSP that you'll see next week. And number three is instead of exhibit, just illustrate the location limits, et cetera, et cetera. Again, because the preliminary plan and the DSP track so closely, those items are shown on the DSP. So three just is specific to what the DSP is going to show that you're going to see next week. That's all. It's usually more flexible language, but because the DSP is next week, it doesn't need to be so open-ended, so we just specified it. Okay. And so that takes care of A. Okay. 3A. Okay. Okay. And B, no change in B. Okay. Got it. Okay. Is that it for you? Yeah, that's really it. Again, I want to thank Ms. Bader for the city's review. I want to thank Mr. Heath. Thank you all. We have the full assemblage of the team here. If there's any specific questions, we certainly respectfully request the board's approval of this preliminary plan, and we very much look forward to next Thursday and presenting you with the detailed site plan. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Tedesco. Thank you. So the whole list of people that we, the parties who have signed up are here for questions only, and then we will go straight to Ms. Bader. Is that correct? That's okay with you? That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So we'll go to Ms. Bader representing the city of College Park. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Chair and planning board members, Miriam Bader, senior planner for city of College Park. The College Park City Council voted 7 to 1 to support 4-20014, and we also reviewed the DSP at the same time, so they also support DSP 19054. And they also voted to support the PUE variation request. The preliminary plan was supported subject to two conditions that have been incorporated into the staff report. We support the staff recommendation, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bader. So that's wonderful, and you've had a 7-0 vote, which is the city of College Park, which clearly illustrates the extent to which you voted with, worked with the city of College Park. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me do a recommendation. I'm sorry. A correction. It was 7 to 1. I'm sorry. It is 7 to 1. I wrote it down. 7 to 1. Sorry. You're absolutely right. 7 to 1. I stand corrected. Okay. So, but you clearly worked very hard with the city of College Park, Mr. Tedesco. Right. And also, if I could, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, if I could just make one clarification. Since we did this, we probably shouldn't have done it this way, but since we did it as just one motion, I just want to clarify that the vote, when it says 7 to 1, I don't think the one vote was against the preliminary plan. It had to do with the DSP. Got it. Oh, I see. Okay. Which we have next week. Yeah, we did it as one motion. That's next week. Okay. Got it. Right. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. So, okay. So, and then we have, obviously, we have the letter from Mr. McGinnis from the University of Maryland. So, that's incorporated into the record, and that's indicating the support, which is wonderful. So, clearly, you worked with the University of Maryland as well. So, with that, 
Um, at the, let's see if the board has any questions of anyone, and if not, let's see. Let's get a motion, Madam Vice Chair. Mm, Madam Vice Chair, and if okay, so let's go to Commissioner Dorner. I just want to ask for staff um, their opinion on the applicant exhibit one. Because um, I think that the UMD letter covered points to A and B, um, but I, I just want to hear what their their feeling is. I, 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 I think Mr. Heath may have responded. Mr. Heath. Uh, yes. So, uh, so that uh, that master plan trail that uh, was on Lehigh Road, just north of the uh, just north of the site, abutting the site, um, originally we wanted that to be a part of the. Uh, a part of the plan, but after discussions with Mr. Tedesco and the applicant and their conversations with you and me, we understood that that was more of a more of a service road, and it's a, a private road, and so it wasn't going to uh, really function the way uh, function the way we you know would hope something like that would function. Because of what their intended uses uh, mm -hmm. have to that particular road, so we agreed to that that revision. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions, Commissioner Dorner? No other questions. Okay, mm -hmm. Commissioner Geraldo, you're uh, muted. Hold on, we're trying to unmute you. Okay. Nope, I'm sorry. No, no questions. No questions. Okay. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so let's um, entertain a motion. Madam Chair, uh, I, I would move that we approve. Find item it. nine, preliminary plan of subdivision. 4-2, I have to find my notes, I'm sorry. Okay. 4-20014, the hub at College Park, along with uh, staff's findings and conditions as further modified and by applicants exhibit number one. And the order will second, but just to clarify, that also includes the variation from section 24. Yes, it does. Right, okay, so, so we have, with clarification, we have a motion um, to approve um, um, the preliminary plan and the variation um, in accordance with applicants exhibit, the revised conditions in applicants exhibit number one, um, and adopting the findings of staff as well. Um, yeah, and, and the revised findings as well, I guess. Right, okay. Applicants exhibit one as well. Okay, and those, that we have the um, revised conditions in applicants exhibit number one. And uh, it's been appropriately seconded, and I don't think I don't know if there's any discussion. So, um, my that vice chair, I think she was having some technical challenges. Madam Vice Chair, but I okay, thank you, um, Commissioner Geraldo. Uh, I will die, and I'd just like to thank uh, the new developer coming into the county. Okay, um, Commissioner Dorner. Good. Okay, thank you. The eyes have it four zero. So. Um, Mr. Um, Gohausen, Go I had it right the first time, Gohausen, and also um, Chip Schnell, um, we welcome you to Prince George's County. We look forward to hearing from you next week. Um, and you too, and you too, Mr. Tedesco. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you for that, Madam Chair. Thank you. We do look forward to you as well. Thank okay. you. Have a great day. All right. Take good care. Thank you. Uh, um, with that, we will turn to, um, is Ms. Hightower on? Nope. Who's doing you? Okay. So we have item uh, 3A, which is legislation. We have a number of cases. I mean, not cases, but a number of pieces of legislation. So we're going to start in, in chronological order, I guess, at CB70. And, we, and you have the um, legislation with you, and you have um, the, the recommendations from staff. So we have our planning director, Ms. Checkley, who will um, present. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Can, wait a minute. Can you see me heard? Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, as the chair stated, we have a, quite a few um, amendments to the code proposed by the council to present for you today. CB70 
is the first one, which is a bill to permit a food hall in the commercial zone. Staff is recommending approval or support with a couple of amendments concerning parking. Okay, Matt. Uh, and to, as to whether or not live entertainment will be permitted and prohibiting adult entertainment in the definition. Thank goodness. Okay. All right. So um, we have um, Madam Planning Director. Um, this, this one is self-explanatory in, in the staff recommendation. Let's see if the board has any questions. Madam Vice Chair? No questions. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? Thank you. No, okay. Um, Commissioner Donner? No question, but I look forward to, to partaking in these food laws. Okay. Is there a motion? Madam Chair. Go ahead. Go ahead, Commissioner. Know that we voted to support CB 7 2020 with the above uh, mentioned amendment. Second. Um, we have a motion and a second. Um, um, to approve with a, a staff recommendation. Um, is there any discussion? Madam Vice Chair? Vote aye. Commissioner Dorner? Vote aye. Commissioner Geraldo? Vote aye. Thank you. Ayes have it 4 0. Next we have CV 72 2020. This legislation amends the requirements for limited Class 3 fill uses. The bill makes technical technical amendments to an existing footnote that permits a class three fill operation in the RA zone without special exception. It basically just clarifies some height limitations that shall not be exceeded. Staff is recommending that the board ad uh, support this amendment. Um, okay, so we have a yes, um, Madam Vice Chair. I'm going to move that we uh, vote to support the 72 2020. Thank you. Is there a second? Do we have a second? We have a motion and a second. Um, um, Madam Vice Chair? Vote aye. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? Vote aye, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, Commissioner Dorner? Vote aye. The ayes have it 4 0. Um, um, we have Chad Williams on for in, if needed. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Madam Planning Director. Uh, CB 73 and 74 will be presented uh, in conjunction because they deal with extending the validity of periods for all detailed site plans, specific design plans, and preliminary plans of subdivision that were valid that were in a valid status as of January 1, 2020. The bill it proposes to extend the validity period for all detailed site plans, specific design plans, and preliminary plans that were approved before January 1, 2015 until December 31, 2020, and applications approved after January 1, 2015 will have their validity if period extended until December 31st, 2022. The planning department is recommending that all plans that were or that are more than 10 years old, 10 or more years old, should expire on December 31st, 2020. That would roughly come to about 114 developments. These developments are well over 10 years old and the planning department is concerned that these incredibly old projects may not meet the requirements of the current zoning ordinance or the goals of plan 2035. In addition, preliminary plans of subdivision in this group are reserving background traffic as defined by the transportation review guidelines and this background traffic must be mitigated by new development projects seeking approval. This means that new economically viable projects become more expensive to build or may not even be made, oh, excuse me, or may be made non-viable 
because older non-viable projects are holding onto reserve transportation capacity that is likely never to be realized. So the staff is recommending an amendment to the bill and asking the board to support that recommendation. Um, thank you, um, Madam Planning Director. So in, not everybody follows this background traffic um, matter so so very closely, but when a preliminary plan is approved um, and it generates some sort of background traffic in an area, then the next preliminary plan that comes in there may be seven years later, and even though nothing has happened and there's been no development, no progress on the first plan, the second plan has to factor in the traffic from that development that has been approved but not yet built. And and if those projects never get built, the, the viable projects that you're talking about that can come along are hampered or hindered. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, basically, that is correct. Yeah. Uh, normally, though, if a project does not move forward at least to final plat. Yeah, final. Well, I mean, the, final. Yeah, the, it would expire. But because of the recession. Right. The council has uh, been routinely extending these preliminary plan uh, okay. approvals, so these applications haven't even gone to uh, final plan. Okay, got it. Okay, so got it. Okay. Does um, the board have any questions on this one? And if not, we can entertain a motion. Move to support with recommended amendment. Second. Okay, now, so I need a little bit of clarification. I want to know what oh, the full effect is of the bill, of so these bills. What the what? Yeah. What was the question? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, you faded in that. What was your question? My question is, I would like our senior counsel to give a, a more. A, what is the practical application of of the uh, of of this bill? Well. It, I mean, I don't know. Okay. I mean, it, it helps. Okay. Um, Mr. That's Goldsmith. I want, I want, that's what I want to know. Okay. M Mr. Goldsmith, are you prepared to address this? I need to pull up a copy of the bill, okay. Madam Chair. Uh, well, don't worry. It. Don't worry. It, it, it really helps. It really helps. Right? We're in a precarious position again. And so it extends the life of these preliminary plans, but, but our, our staff has recommended a time limit on the extension. Okay, so, I go along with it. That's what I want okay. to make clear, Madam Chair, is the time limit, because I don't want things to go in ad infinitum. Right. And Madam Chair knows that we have these problems right. time time again that residents complain about. Right. Traffic and, that, and everything, so that, I agree. That's, okay, so is, is, mm -hmm. so is that a motion? That's a motion. That motion is what? To approve? What's yes. Your, okay. Okay. okay, we have a motion and a second to approve staff's recommendation. Um, Madam Vice Chair? Aye. Commissioner Dorner? Good I I'll just mention that I think that this is more consistent with our attempt to shift to the new zoning code so everything is in better conformance. Point well taken. Um, so, uh, highlighting that in the uh, recommendation would be great. Okay. Um, um, Commissioner Geraldo? I vote aye. Thank you. Um, okay, so next we have CB80. Madam Chair, uh, CB80 is a bill to permit contractor's office as a use in the re rural residential zone under certain circumstances. Staff initially recommended to the council uh, a disapproval of this amendment, but with some amendment suggested amendments, and the council took into account at the Committee of the Whole staff's recommendations and amended the bill so now we're on draft two and with those amendments staff is now prepared to recommend the book to the board that they support the bill with an amendment um, is questions is that so no. that, that's a motion madam vice chair are you making a motion uh, move to support with amendment to be 85 2020 Second. We have a motion and a second from com um, Commissioner Geraldo. Mr. Williams, I see you signed on. Did, was there something you wanted to say on this one or no? Uh, no, Madam Chair. I'm just here in case the okay. board has any questions on any of the bills. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion Thank and you. a second. Uh, Madam Vice Chair? Aye. 
Commissioner Geraldo? Vote aye. Commissioner Dorner? Vote aye. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Um, CB 83? CB 83 is a bill to prohibit fly ash landfills in Prince George's County. We currently have one. And as it is the council's prerogative to make these type of policy decisions and it's in within its purview to permit or prohibit uses uh, staff is recommending support with an amendment um, okay so um, are there any questions madam? No, madam chair move to support with amendment please we have a motion second and a second by Commissioner Geraldo. Motion by Vice Chair Bailey. Um, Vice Chair Bailey? Vote aye. Commissioner Geraldo? Vote aye. Commissioner Dorner? Vote aye. Uh, motion carries 4 0. Next we have CB 85. CB 85 is a bill to add a new use entitled Industrial Redevelopment Community in the zoning ordinance and permit the use in the heavy industrial I-2 zone subject to certain criteria. However, the bill does not define what an industrial redevelopment community is. And it, there are some limiting factors to the bill, but in essence, it allows residential uses on I-2 zone properties and at a large scale. And so staff uh, has a lot of concerns with this bill, but mainly that residential uses and I-2 industrial uses are highly incompatible. We have identified approximately 332 I-2 zone properties that this would impact or could impact. And the bill does not define, as I stated, the new use, um, but it's added to the residential table. And so there are no standards associated with it for the, if the bill was passed for the board to uh, evaluate the application when it came forward. So there's a lot of, um, issues with this bill and staff believes that an additional study with a comprehensive review of all the I-2 zone properties in the revitalization tax credit district should happen before anything moves on this particular uh, amendment. So staff is recommending the board oppose the bill pending additional study. Okay. so. I-1 is light industrial and I-2 is heavy industrial, which is the highly intensive industrial manufacturing uses. Um, and so you're, you, you're saying that there's 332 such I-2 zones in the county and um, it just warrants more study um, from our staff's perspective. Right, now, because these are two very incompatible right. uses. Okay, for, for, for to put residential there. Okay, so we have a speaker signed up for this one. Mr. Taub? Here we go. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, good members afternoon. of the board. The record, I'm Larry Tao, uh, attorney with O'Malley, Miles, Donald, and Gilmore in Greenville. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon. I want to thank you, uh, the board and the chair in particular, for allowing me to speak uh, this afternoon on this bill. Um, I need to give some background on this because it really is very relevant to uh, the reason we are here today with regard to this legislation. Uh, this is with regard to property that is located in the area known as Branchville, which is the southern portion of North College Park in that area. And what we have in a situation like that is uh, an area that has been there for decades as a heavy industrial area, but it is um, really within the uh, North College Park area, which is predominantly residential. The fact is that uh, we are in a situation here where we have heavy industrial property. My client purchased this property several years ago and uh, spent the first several years going through, <clears throat> excuse me, environmental remediation on the property. Um, he then decided that he saw the vision here 
of redeveloping this as a residential community. And the, I think one of the most important facts here, and that differentiates this from the other number of I-2 properties elsewhere in the county, is that this property in particular has been recommended for residential infill redevelopment by the, the most recent sector plan for this property that impacts this property, which is the Greenbelt Metro area from October 2001. And if I'm not mistaken, it was also recommended for residential infill redevelopment uh, back in 1989 as well. So for, for several decades, uh, the county land use policy for this particular property has been recommending residential uh, redevelopment of this property. Um, I, I must mention also that the city of College Park uh, has been very supportive of this legislation. Uh, the city, the mayor testified at the uh, Prince George's County Council Committee of the Whole on Tuesday with regard to this in support of this legislation. And, and in that, in that uh, testimony, he testified, among other things, that the city actually even considered purchasing the property several years back before my client did. Um, for the very reason that they were concerned about its continuation as a heavy industrial use this close to a, an existing residential community. Um, I'd like to go through some of the points raised by the staff. Uh, I'll try not to take too much time here. But with regard to the definition, uh, we have provided a, a draft definition to Ms. Hightower um, this morning, and I'll just read okay, it to you. Hold, hold on a second. The, okay, hold on a second, Mr. Tom. I want to make, do, do you have that? Okay. Um, so we don't, oh, you can read it to us, and because and, um, I don't know that we have it here. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Mr. Taub. Um It would be the redevelopment of, pro this would be a definition of industrial redevelopment community. It would be the redevelopment of property, one, consisting of at least 10 contiguous acres, Two, currently in a heavy industrial zone located adjacent to a rail line and within a revitalization tax credit district. Three, recommended for residential redevelopment in the applicable master plan or sector plan. And four, proposed for redevelopment with residential and associated uses subject to the standards and requirements set forth in section 27-475.06.10. So I think the most critical issue in that definition, really two, number one, is that it is it has to be recommended for residential redevelopment in the applicable master plan or sector plan, and secondly, that we are limiting the uh, redevelopment to residential and associate uses. Um, so and we believe that addresses at least two of the concerns raised. Um, with regard to the loss of industrial property in the county, um, as I said before, the county land use policy for this particular property for decades now has been to see a residential redevelopment of this property. Um, yes, there would be some loss of industrial property, but uh, it is not a, an ideal location. Uh, this is located immediately across the railroad tracks from the Greenbelt Metro uh, property, and, and we see how that has redeveloped over the years. Um, with regard to the issue that it is close to a rail line, that is true. But I would note also that there have been some very, very nice developments um, already redeveloped here further to the south, I guess we could say. Um, that would be, for example, Caford's property, now Riverdale Park Station, uh, also Arts District Hyattsville. Uh, both of them are right along the same rail line and have done very well. Um, the issue of taking more time to look at development standards and to look, take a comprehensive study, the problem we have is that we have an opportunity that is here before us right now. If the legislation is not approved, um, I, I cannot say for sure, but, but I would say there is a good likelihood that uh, my client will simply go ahead and continue to lease the property or to sell the property for the exist, under the existing zoning and to other heavy industrial uses. This is an opportunity for the county to take this property, to have it redeveloped as has been recommended for decades and, and move it forward. My client has a vision to do this, but he cannot sit here for a long period of time. Uh, it would not be economically viable to do so and wait for this to occur. So there is an opportunity here uh, to have this done. And we think, and we've um, 
We've worked with uh, Councilman Genova on this. We've worked with Councilman Hawkins on this. Uh, as I said, the City of College Park has been very supportive of this legislation. And um, uh, in fact, as I said, it testified in its favor at the Committee of the Whole on Tuesday. So with all that, uh, I would respectfully request that you uh, consider uh, and that you would, in fact, recommend approval of this legislation given all the somewhat unique so. characteristics of this particular property and the particular timing of this issue and the uh, the other legislative issues that have been addressed here. Mr. I would be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Taub, I, I, I'm, I'm, cons I'm concerned here only because I hear what you're what you've submitted today as a, as a, def a potential definition, but um, Ms. Checkley has indicated that we're talking about, you're talking about a specific property. The Right now we have 332 I-2 zone properties. And that and so that that's what makes it problematic. And um, it's the 332 I-2 properties within a revitalization tax district. So you're trying to refine it and saying, okay, it's gotta be over uh, 10 acres, is um, adjacent to a railroad, it has to have been recommended in a prior, um, for residential in a prior, prior sector plan and which not which according to you this is and that may make sense but we didn't have all that we don't have that in front of us right now right now this bill talks is applicable to 332 sites i think i understand your concerns and we're not trying to necessarily heavy industrial is is problematic but but maybe um the sector plan here talks about residential in this site but Maybe there's an, I understand your concerns and, 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 and potentially lost opportunity here for your client if we go forward with a long study, but it seems like some of this, where are we in the council process where some of this can be hashed out? Where we are now, this is, has really moved along very quickly. And yeah. the uh, committee of the whole for the council heard this this past Tuesday. Oh, yeah. uh, they held it in committee. All right. uh, Why, did they, Why did they hold it? Why did they hold it? I think, uh, among other reasons, they wanted to hear from the planning board on this. At least that was my recollection. That was one of the statements they made. Okay. Um, and uh, and I would point out, uh, Madam Chair, that you know the, the most to me the most significant issue here is that this is property that has been recommended for residential revitalization in the master plan. They your property, yes, your property. But what about the bill? Doesn't seem to how, how, does the bill? But it's, but that one, I'm sorry, that would apply to any property, you're right, in the county, but any property that was also recommended for residential revitalization there, okay. redevelopment. Is that in the bill? Bill. Show me where that is in the bill. Uh, what I'm saying is that, no, that's that's why, I'm, no, I'm, let me get it here, hold on one second. Hold on, that sounds like there. that's in your new definition, your proposed no, definition. No, it's in the bill. It's in hold the bill? Hold on a second. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Um, Purposes under under A one. What page? Wait a minute. What page are you on? Page four of the bill. Okay. Draft yeah. one. Uh huh. To promote the orderly redevelopment of industrially zoned land located within a revitalization tax credit that is recommended for transition to residential land use in the applicable okay, master so plan. Okay. So it is in the bill. Okay. 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 So it is in the bill, okay. and I would propose to reinforce that through the definition. Okay. Um, and and we do allow obviously for detailed site plan. Um, Review so there is there will be review of the manner in which it will it will be deemed to be compatible. In fact, that is one of the findings also with the other uses nearby. So I think we we really attempted to address the issues that we know will arise here. Um, but you know, it, it is <laughs> it's funny because I have many 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 times here been before the board and before the council um, trying to argue. Um, in really against recommendations from the master plan. Here I am before the, the board now trying to argue the manner in which we can actually implement the recommendation, the long standing recommendation of the master plan for this particular property, along with standing alongside the municipality in which it is located. I, I, it is municipality, you, it is consistent with the master plan, and, and frankly, I think this is. As I said, it is an opportunity that frankly does not come along every day to see this happen because frankly, this redevelopment 
is is causing my client many more problems and probably would be less financially viable for him in the long run, but uh, he sees a vision here. And he's willing to do this. And I think uh, what we're trying to do is to to allow this to occur. But again, we believe by putting it in the legislation and again, the definition that if it's limited to property that is recommended for this type of redevelopment in the master plan, that would do no more than to allow it to be consistent with the county's land use policies. And I suspect that would be a very limiting factor to other industrial properties in the county. Now, Mr. Taub, when the council took it under advisement, did they take it under advisement for a week or two weeks or indefinitely? It was just held, and in fact, held, is, I mean, and held, as I understand, Madam Chair, as I understand it, um, the final day for introduction is next Tuesday. So the fact is, at least as I understand it right now, if it's not introduced by Tuesday, um, it, it well, may not go forward. Okay, so it, but even after it's introduced, there's time. To, there's t what, you know, there's time for amendments and whatnot. Uh, it, well, yes, but I think it can be, as I understand it. When we get to the public hearing, there can be amendments that cannot be substantive amendments, I believe, is, is, the, is the limiting factor to that. Um, there can be amendments. This, is, this would be scheduled, if it gets to introduction on Tuesday, it would be scheduled for public hearing on, I believe, November 17th, whatever the last day of the council will be, maybe the 19th. Um, mm -hmm. and, and as I understand, all legislation is going to be scheduled for public hearing that day. Okay. Um, we have our planning director here who has, who has a comment or so. Well, yes, there's a couple of issues right now. Uh, one, what is before the board today does not contain the definition and some other important aspects that Mr. Taub would like to include in the bill, that some of which would address staff's concerns. Not all of them, but some of it. But that is not before the board today. What's before today is the original bill. And at the Council of the Whole, the yes. motion... Which passed Tuesday. Yeah, yes, this, week. Pa this, this just happened. They put it on hold indefinitely. So I don't know if it's, it may come back on Tuesday, it may not. But right now, what is before the board is the original bill as it was drafted. And it, contain, it still contains all of the issues that staff presented. Additionally, while Mr. Taub is absolutely correct about what the sector plan and the master plan speak about this property, Plan 2035, which came along like I think 13 to 15 years later, specifically notes that the county needs to start looking at its heavy industrial properties and how we're losing them. So you have an older uh, master plan saying this, but you have 2035 saying that. But as I stated earlier, all of that is not relevant right now because what is before the board is the originally draft bill that staff cannot recommend uh, supporting. So let me ask this question. Thank you. And then I'm going to see if the board has any questions of you. Um, Mr. Williams is on. Do you have anything to add, Mr. Williams? Um, not this time. I think uh, the, the okay. director put it very well with the, particularly the point for Plan 2035 and um, the bill that's before the board today. Okay. So, it, it, you know, maybe. <laughs> Um, I'm a tad I'm not confused. To, to respond or oh, no, nothing, yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. What what I am, um, what what seems fairly apparent to me is that your concern that, that your this is doable, I think, um, with maybe your definition as the planning director said takes care of addresses some of the issues. And you know maybe what maybe um, our the recommendation can uh, be fine tuned a little bit to a, a, a accompany some of the definitions of you know um, so we stick with the um, I don't see how we can change the staff's um, 
uh, recommendation of, of not, su um, not supporting as written. But, you know, maybe, maybe in the course of conversation or in the course of dealings with the council, um, that the, um, your proposed definition and maybe there's some other language that can be added to get, make it, get it to the point where it's, um, and they may approve it anyway without our recommendation. It doesn't sound to me like they held it specifically for our recommendation because in that case, they know we meet on Thursdays, they would have held it for a week or so. But the mere fact that they held it indefinite makes it sound like they ha they may have had some other reason. But um, go, on. go ahead. Uh, but but I, I but I think there's a you know way to get your points across. Okay, Mr. Taub. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it, Madam Chair. Let me just say a couple things. First of all, the the definition, uh, I only saw the staff's re uh, the staff report here uh, Tuesday morning before the committee of the whole, right. um, and. You know, but the, the draft of the definition was my res my attempt to respond to that particular yeah. concern. So we had no other opportunity to do it. But my commitment to the board is that I would I would submit that definition uh, to the sponsor of the legislation to have it uh, amended to add that definition in, and that that would be the manner in which I propose to do this. So, and I think that it, it would be I would assume it would be so so amended to add that in there. Um, with regard to um, the discussion on Plan 2035, um, you know, that may well, it talks about the value of, of industrial properties, that is true, but location is extremely important here. This is, as I said, immediately adjacent to a residential community. This may not be one of the, the industrial properties that should be uh, continued on. In fact, as I said, many, many years now, it has been recommended to for residential redevelopment because that will be consistent with what we have here. Um, the city is right alongside with us on this. And, and I think that frankly, I would appreciate a reconsideration of this because I think that the support of the board could be very important to this. And if you want to have support subject to certain uh, conditions, that's fine. But there is a, a very important distinction between opposition because of certain reasons or support subject to certain conditions. And I think the potential for good here, the potential for something that is is a would be a great outcome at this location um, is is so great and the opportunity is so fleeting that I would hope we could get a recommendation of approval subject to certain conditions. Um, and uh, we don't know what the future of the property is, but this at least allows possibility Here, here's the thing here's the thing hold on a second here's the th here's the thing mr. Taub. Um, um we don't know we the whole the, the legislative process sometimes is very condensed and we meet on Thursdays and we didn't even have a chance to get our comments in on the bill prior to the committee of the whole meeting on Tuesday so we meet on Thursday so so therefore you didn't have the opportunity to have the planning board's input you had the planning staff input and then you get caught a little off guard and now you have the definition which you you know you had to come up with fairly quickly given the fact that you only heard about this on Tuesday but now we're hearing about it on Thursday so we have to deal with this and we don't know it may address some of our issues and maybe not all of our issues and we don't really know that at this point I'm willing to say and, and I know I'll get to the board members with uh, other questions I'm willing to say um, um, the, your proposed definition, if it's read into the record, um, and we put it in our letter, um, may improve the situation. I don't know that we can change the, the recommendation right now because I don't think we have enough information. The only other thing we can do since it was held indefinitely is to post, continue this for a week and then work through things before we send our recommendation because it doesn't seem like it's going to be, it's going to come up the beginning of, of, this, of this coming week for the council. So that's another option. But I, I can't see how we actually changed the entire recommendation. And, and, I, and in response to your statement, yes, I know you would like to have um, um, a support, you know, conditional support. But we don't know yet. This It's, it's too rushed. We don't know yet whether the, your conditions work. It sounds like from our planning director they may improve the situation, but we don't know if they address all of our concerns. And... So maybe a conti maybe continuing this helps. Maybe we maybe we put in the letter as is today that that 
your proposed definition um, um, alleviates some of our concerns or allays some of our concerns. Um, but, and then the other part of it is, you know, the count, I know you'd rather have our, our support, but the council is going to make their determination. Thank you. With, yeah, yeah, they're going to make theirs anyway, you know, and 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 they listen to what we have, they hear what we have to say, but they're going to make their decision based on what they want to do anyway. Yeah. Um, but so, I, our our recommendation is not controlling either way. It's not controlling. You know that. It's true, but but I think that it's also fair to say that the council does listen to yeah. the recommendation of the board yeah. and does take. Uh, I think it's, it's a fair fruit on that. Anyway. Um, and, and rightfully so. I mean, your your recommendations are, are very important here, especially matters of land use. Um, and I appreciate what you said, Madam Chair. I do. Um, I would simply tell you that that I'm not sure if we're going to get past Tuesday at this point. That's the critical issue. If we do, oh, is this coming uh, Tuesday? I come back and what do you mean? Is this, me? is this past Tuesday? This coming. I mean, this coming Tuesday. I mean, this coming Tuesday. Yes, ma'am. As I understand it. Tuesday is the last day for introduction of bills. Okay. If it is right. not introduced by Tuesday, okay. it will probably be, be dead at that point. Okay, well. um, and, and they have to reconvene as committee as a whole. This is even going to be taken up. And working backwards, that's really my point. At least okay. one of the reasons that they were uh, that they held this in committee was to uh, hear back from the planning. They wanted to get more information. That okay. was what I understood to be the case. Okay. Now, there may well be other issues. I don't know, but I'm simply suggesting that in the definition I gave you, while that's not in the record, that's true at this point, it incorporates all the issues that are actually in the legislation now. As I pointed out, all these conditions are in there. So I would simply suggest to you uh, and, rec and, and respectfully request that um, you possibly consider at least um, Maybe giving a neutral position on this with some with issues of of you know your concern, but uh, indicating that the potential for good, because I think there is great potential for good in this situation with this particular property. And as I indicated again, the City of College Park is right alongside with us. They have wanted to see this happen for quite a long time. They see this as we see it as a real opportunity. Um, that, that may well go away. We don't know, but it, it could. And, and but I they're zeroed, in, they're zeroed in on one property. And this applies to several properties. But okay, let's. Well, let's we, uh, uh, Madam Chair, if I let, may. Yeah, who is uh, it? Mr. Williams? Uh, Chad Williams. Yes, okay. Madam Chair. Um, I have a couple of points, and I don't know if this is something that you may want to do, but Ms. Hightower did send me the proposed definition, and Mr. Talbaret. So if you wanted to have that up on the screen and look at, uh, I that would that help, maybe. Okay, that would help. Um, and I can also discuss the, the remaining concern staff has with the definition itself. Okay, that would As help. As to Mr. Taub's point on, um, and, and I'll, I'll share my screen in just a moment. Mr. Taub's point on the, the property and relationship with Plan 2035, I'm very familiar with this property, uh, as Mr. Taub would know, uh, at being the area planner for the area. And the, both the 1989 master plan and the 2001 sector plan had um, SMAs that were associated with them. One was a concurrent, one was a subsequent. So had the council um, agreed that the, the recommendation of the plan was sufficient to warrant rezoning to residential to facilitate that residential development, they had two opportunities in 1990 and 2001. Uh, so I, my belief is that they, they were considering the future applicability perhaps of a comprehensive design zone or other residential zoning tool to um, implement the recommendations. Part of why staff's recommending the study is to take into consideration locational aspects of industrial land, how close they are to residential land, whether it would be uh, appropriate to continue recommending residential or industrial Sorry about my cat getting in the screen here. Uh, residential or industrial on a given property. Uh, so that's part of the study. Um, I will now try to share my screen if I can see how. Um, I'm still blacked out on the screen share. Mr. Williams, can I ask you a quick question uh, since you have a lot of background in this area? Um, would, it, would it not make sense to do more of like a, a, an MUX or MUI kind of zone for this, similar to what like the Cape Reeds or the, the Arts District areas are, are zoned at or a mixed use town center instead of like an I2? Because that's my, my problem with this is I, I don't want to do spot zoning. I realize that this is 
a, a help for Mr. Taub's client, and he's rightfully advocating on behalf of his client, but I, I abhor, abhor spot zoning because it, it sets a terrible precedent for all the other legislative kind of zoning matters we're trying to do. And I don't want to make any recommendation in support of this kind of legislation for a single use property. Um, I, I would be receptive to um, a change in the zoning. So like M MUI, um, MUA, M MUX, um, or MXT, sorry, or MUTC, which would be very consistent with what is actually across the Rio Grande from that property and what is also been done in the Cape Reese development in the Arts District area. I, actually, I live in one of those areas, so I, I'm very, I'm fine with the, the railroad and that stuff going in there. Um, but I don't think the right way of doing this, although the more convenient and faster way of doing it is through a legislative change, I don't think that's the, the right way to do it. Um, so I, I'm wondering if, if, if you would think that like a, an MXT or MUI um, zone would be more appropriate, or maybe even an RMF, um, kind of going out into the newest zoning code. Right, that's a great, uh, a great question, Commissioner Gordner. And before I answer, just for technical staff, if you can share it with just the one called Chad Williams instead of Chad Williams camera only. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a webcam on my computer, so I'm using two setups. Um, I, I would say that the MUI zone certainly would not be a candidate for this property. Uh, MUI requires the use of an overlay zone, mm -hmm. unless certain circumstances are met. Uh, the MXT would also be a challenge in terms of Uh, in terms of meeting the locational criteria, it's a, it's a technical challenge. Uh, and then there would be, uh, with some of the other zones, uh, I, I see this chair, so I'll get that up here. Um, with some of the other zones that you mentioned, uh, the RMF might be a good fit um, in the future when that takes effect. But unfortunately, that's not to the now, to Mr. Taub's point about timing. Uh, the last point about the mixed use is that the MXT, for example, would require mixed use. And with the definition that I've now hopefully shared on your screens, the concern staff has with the definition is that it still doesn't tell us exactly what, what kind of use is what this use is in industrial mm -hmm. residential community. So it flags residential and associated uses, but associated uses is not any kind of zoning term that has any weight. If this had said um, accessory uses, we would use the common law definition of accessory to help us figure this out. Um, so an associated use could be literally anything. Uh, and then with residential uses, it's unclear to us if this is single family detached, single family attached, multifamily, live work. There's a lot of uses in the current code that fall into this umbrella. So this doesn't, this definition, while it does help staff, as the director said, doesn't, in our opinion, give you as the board enough to go on in making a decision on any future industrial redevelopment community applications. Um, may I respond then, Yeah. Yes, Mr. Tao. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, first of all, to Commissioner Derner, um, I would suggest to you that this, in a certain sense, is the exact opposite of spot zoning. Because uh, what we're trying to do, frankly, is to, um, to allow the development to be uh, more consistent with the surrounding community, uh, not to differ. I mean, frankly, what you have there now is this I-2 property um, in the middle of the industrial community is, is far more, at least conceptually, along the lines of spot zoning than that which we're proposing, which is to be more consistent with what the, the, considering the uh, surrounding neighborhood. Secondly, I want to point out also that my client specifically did not want to put this, uh, to do this as a mixed-use zone because of the fact that there are so many commercial uses in the area, in particular the Hollywood commercial area, which the City of College Park has long, and, and frankly, the North College Park community has long wanted to be upgraded, well, with additional homes here that will give at least potentially spur more redevelopment of that commercial area. Uh, the mayor has also indicated that the uh, commercial uses along Route 1, which is certainly very easily accessible from here, really need additional homes to support that. Um, they are looking for that, and for that reason, we specifically did not want to see this done as a mixed-use community. Uh, with regard to Mr. Williams' uh, issue with regard to calling this residential and associated uses, really this is just a residential development that would include the typical 
uh, recreational space, things of that nature. That's all it was intended to be. So we could, I could work with your staff on, a, on better terminology if they believe that would be better there. But the intent is simply to allow this as a residential development. And I would point out that um, one of the findings uh, in the bill now says that the proposed redevelopment, which may include housing types different from the predominant housing type in the surrounding community, is compatible with developed industrial or residential properties in the surrounding community and contributes positively to the community character. So we believe that there, there are sufficient guidelines in here to, uh, to assure that there is compatibility, to um, hopefully have this to be a positive contribution to the entire community by allowing us to actually provide additional um, residents to serve the existing commercial community around them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so let me get back to the board and, and see if there are any more questions of anyone at this juncture. I, no, Madam Chair, I understand Mr. Tutov's uh, need for urgency and the quote unquote possibility that his his client may not move on it but i remember very well the discussions that we had on the plan 2035 particularly with the industrial areas that was one of the areas that i pushed for to keep the industrial because there's such a lack of industrial space uh in and around the area so i would i'm not saying that i oppose it but I certainly am uh, sympathetic to the comments made by staff. And I think there needs to be more study. Are there any Just other? My okay. Uh, do any other board members have questions? Commissioner Dorner? No, no more questions. And thank you, Mr. Town, for the clarifications. Okay. Um, Madam Vice Chair, do you have any questions? I, I don't have any questions, Matt. Okay, Mr. Goldsmith, do you have any comment? Um, I think my, my only comment is I highlighted the same language that Mr. Williams highlighted uh, in the definition regarding residential and associated uses. I wasn't clear exactly what you meant. Okay. Um, okay. So if there are no questions of anyone, is there a motion? Mr. Madam Chair, I would... I would move that we accept the recommendations of staff on the bill. And I would not mind, I would not be adverse to uh, in our uh, communication with the council that we uh, use the language or suggest a definition, uh, but with an expansion on the issue of uh, residential and an expansion of the issue of, uh, as opposed to associated, make it accessory. Mr. Gerald, I was getting ready to second, but I'm not sure I clearly understand the motion. So um, the motion is we oppose it, but I have no objection to including within our comments when we oppose it with the language suggested it was on the screen by, by Mr. Talbot. But as further, as further uh, modified by taking into account the concerns of staff. So, all right, so let me see if, if there's a second. I, oh, I go with the motion. Go with which motion? Go. Motion to spade. Oh. Oh. This is Commissioner Dorner. I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll second the it's motion. Um, and then just under discussion, yeah, I think it'd be helpful um, based on what Mr. Williams and Mr. Goldsmith had indicated for um, the, the legal definition to be a little bit more precise. Um, that way we can actually map it to our, our existing land use code um, and potentially the, the proposed land use um, in, in the, the new zoning rewrite. Um, I'm, I'm not as concerned about one property. And I understand the, the consistency with the surrounding areas, but I think we could probably find other zones that would be potentially more consistent and, and allow you to create greater density for the commercial spaces around there. Um, 
So I, I don't want to necessarily tailor our, our opinions to one particular property, but to the extent that we can offer our expertise and at least providing clearer definitions if, if this does go forward, um, that would be good so we don't have problems down the road. Right now, um, we've been only talking about one property and there's 331 other properties that would be affected by this that probably don't have nearly the same kind of um, scenarios and, and actually we might have inadvertent negative kind of um, effects that, that result from um, changing the code too much. But I'll, I'll second the motion. So let me make sure, you know, we have our technical hearing writer here and um, let me make sure we're clear on the motion. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it. Do I, well, I, I don't even know if I can paraphrase it, but basically yes, you you're saying, you're saying you're, you're supporting the staff recommendation. However, yeah. you are including the, the, we would need the specific language, which um, Ms. Hightower has, and we would put that in the staff recommendations and saying that um, we, because you're not, it's not definitive. You're saying that that um, improves, improves that that improves the legislation it to some ex, to some extent. Um, yes. But you have, you still have additional concerns. Um, basically, is that it? That's about it. Okay. Is that is that mm. the seconder? Is, is that get, right. But Mr. Tad, yeah, that, that, that's fine because a lot of times when we oppose legislation, we we've been we haven't in the past um, given explanations for why, and then we started doing that maybe a year. Oh year no, we always do. Okay, well, I, I think this is at least consistent in, in providing clarifications that if they want to go forward with this kind of legislation, here's here's how we think it could be made better or improved to be more consistent with what we would want to see. Um, so I, I think that's fine. Okay. We, we do because I typically I have signed letters to the council to that effect and we I, and, I, and I scour them to, to make sure that we because we offer we, we either sometimes we are able to say support with these proposed amendments and sometimes it's um, support period sometimes it's um, and if we if we um, do not support uh -oh. we usually we usually say why and and sometimes we um, and, and, and express our concerns. So I, I think we have concerns here and maybe they can be addressed. And, and I, so I think we're flagging it. I think that's what the two commissioners are saying. They're flagging it for, to see if the council can address it. We're not trying to kill your client, Mr. Tao, but uh, in, your, in the proposal, but we're hamstrung right now in a very compressed period of time. You were and we are. And so anyway, that, that's, so that's the motion. Okay, That's the so, motion. Okay, so I'm the technical hearing right now. Ms. Cracker, you got the, uh, the motion. Okay. <laughs> Madam Vice Chair? Uh, 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 I'm Okay. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? Vote aye. Okay. Um, Commissioner Dorner? Vote aye. Um, and I vote aye, so it's three, um, uh, zero, yeah. and one abstention. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I think the discussion may may help, um, um, Mr. Tao. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the board. I appreciate your consideration and I appreciate at least your attempt to try to um, help the council better understand some of the issues. I, I do understand that and uh, your understanding of the timing we have here. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, um, Mr. Hunt, are you on? Yes, Madam Chair, I'm here. Is there any additional business to come before the planning board today? Those are all the business items before the planning board today. Thank you. Planning board is adjourned. Happy Indigenous Thank People you. Day on Monday. Thank you.